This is the thing with Zoom. It's hard to not talk over so you end up being staccato so that the other person might interject. That's going to be really annoying to listen to in the future. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. We're absolutely delighted to be back and to be talking, uh, albeit over uh, Zoom, as I am uh, on the road uh, a little bit, to be bringing you this episode on the Feast of St. Dismas, or indeed any number of ways that we might say that name. Uh, or other names by which this saint is great. So this episode, uh, we're very, very, very glad and excited, obviously. Uh, to be bringing you the Saint Dismas, the demon of Valifar, Valifor or Valifur, and that fur is uh, significant, we'll be patting that fur. The plant Pimpernel, and indeed many of the plants called Pimpernel, and indeed many of the operations with a, a, a translation and, or indeed a mistranslation, certain grimoric workings of Pimpernel. The stone turquoise, the magic of the Alma Christi, the instruments of the passion, the geomantic figure uh, Aquistio, and its uh, counterparted Odin Ofun, and the trump card Justice, and indeed our magicians this time around are the Fox Sisters, Leah, Maggie, and Kat, Catherine, Katie, Kat, Kate. I mean, uh, that's not a familiarity, that's a lack there. I also found just the, the overall mercurial theme of this these topics. Like, this is a, mm-hmm. well, figure excluded, but still, like, still so much mercury and everything else going on here. And maybe that's the thing of doing the feast of a thief. But like the Fox sisters also, curiously, I forgot that the entire anniversary of spiritism is March 31st, which is in proximity to, of course, the 25th being Dismas's day. I noticed to be, yeah, I noticed a, a very mercurial thread and the interaction between what I call like mercurial things and like how mercury things feel about Jupiter things is the other big planetary influence that I saw. But one way to acquire things is to steal. So right? or be a merchant or many other things. Yes. Al graced me with a, a chapter on acquisition of forthcoming bounty. I hope papyri from your hands. But the, the notion of acquisition being the, the, the business of the front to Letizia being the party in the back, uh, mm-hmm. the mullet of Jupiter and, and just <laughs> that, that side of Jupiter of EB, it doesn't end well. <laughs> at a certain point, I think you even you even quoted Nick in there. So it is also happening that this is the thing I read in the last hour in our prep for our talk. So of course it's in the forefront of my mind. So maybe you want to take it back to Saint Dismas and proceed. Yeah. Of course, accustomed to our yeah. We usually start with with the saint in the day, right? And I, I like that there's the orientation in time as well. In, in the that's we we tend to at the further we go on, the more on the the more individual that the sequences are usually. Like we. we but between things, but we, I like starting with the saint, actually. I think that's nice. So Saint Dismas, aka uh, Sandimas or Demas uh, or Titus in the Arabic infancy gospel, which uh, instantly made me think he was played by Titus Burgess of uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, but that's again, headcanon now. So Lawrence Cunningham in the Brief History of Saints, I found posits that the name Dismas might have been adapted from a Greek word meaning sunset or indeed death. And and I, I, those onomastic things are... On the one hand, it's easy to read those and be like, are you speculating just because like the Latin word looks similar? And, and as a historian, I want to be like, where's the manuscript where it says like, that's why it's that, who posited that idea. But also those things, that analytics does end up useful because that's how hagiographic blur also works. Not just like, quote, confute big air quotes, confusing your johns, but having to understand that like there are a bunch of folk etymologies that are being spun in a variety of ways to understand and engage with the saint and mystery. Certainly the notion of calling Jesus, Jesus is, it is a blur across languages and time and projection. And the notion that Christ is like a last name. This is a, a prime example of this tradition in that you don't, we don't necessarily need to refer to someone by their accurate name that we know them. I respond to asshole all the time. Um, <laughs> and amongst many other colorful terms. But as right. long as you can cash the check. I, right. But to be, to be summary, because I noticed that one thing, we did get good feedback from some lovely people about the show. It's like, sometimes you talk about the saint for an hour and I still don't know who you're talking about. So 
let me summarize it by saying St. Dismas is the good thief, the thief to the right of Jesus at his right hand when he is crucified on the hill of Golgotha. And there is the bad thief, the one that says, like, get me off, you could have done this. And Dismas is like, chill, we're, we're guilty, he's not. And Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise, by which there's a whole tradition set up that St. Dismas is the only person that we know is actually a saint. The rest, we suppose, are saints through visions, through intercessions, through their acts in life. But Dismas is the only one that canonically is a saint, other than if you want to classify angels and the patriarchs as saints. But we're talking here about Jesus himself in the gospel saying, you're going to be with me before the day is out in heaven, which in traditional Christian theology beats everybody else because everybody else that's dead, if you're not a saint, you're waiting until the second coming for your tomb to open, hopefully face in east, hopefully you're not scattered to the winds in cremation at remains in cremains. But Dismas is a saint and the first official saint, which is amazing that it's a good thief. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and not just in terms of like trauma bonding with the savior, but like he's, yeah, exactly. Like I, I love the way that there is a strange paradise as, as well. And there's, there's some stuff the Orthodox Church do on Good Fridays where the, the Synaxarian, the Synaxarian? has this lovely couplet about Eden's locked gates, the thief has opened wide by putting in the key, remember me. And that's that's that thing, right? Like the the bad thief is in some accounts, or the, the impenitent thief, in some accounts, it's also his rudeness to Christ that's yeah. like, that he's ad- admonished for as well, as well as his like unrepentant state, or it's like, prove that you are the son of God by getting us down from here. Which is very little girl as the devil in Last Temptation, right? There's also, I really love the cyclical time factor that Catholicism plays in the cyclical time really well. I mean, if you're going to map yourself onto uh, seasonal rounds, uh, especially for a tropical or Mediterranean climate, not tropical like tropics, but temperate Mediterranean. Yeah. Anyway, correction. But Mediterranean climate that Catholicism especially evolved to adapt to of spring and what this is, and that the 25th of March is the original Good Friday. That this is, and this 25s, of course, are significant because you have the 25s be the Christmas being the standard for winter solstice, but it's just after our corrected winter solstice. But there's proof that things are happening by that time, that the astronomical event has happened if we're going to be paying attention to it. Just like the 24th is St. John's Day, his birth, Jesus's birth on the 25th. And then the Good Friday, March 25th, is also the Annunciation. So this is when Gabriel breathes and announces into the world that Mary is now pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So the incarnation of Jesus in a mortal body, in the womb of his mother, happens on March 25th. And therefore, the nine months later of December 25th, is makes sense. And that Jesus enters into heaven the same day that he was born. Uh, not born, but incarnated. That the humanity exists in this book ended at March 25th, like Shakespeare. Shakespeare's birthday, not that he's much right. in and out on the same day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love that. Love that. There's uh, there's stuff about, there's, a, there's a, another connection to the, the Holy Family I was reading about, again, in the Arabic infancy gospel, where it talks about the both thieves and sometimes the in, impenitent, is that the word? Un, unrepentant priest is called Gestas. And in that one, he's called Dumathus and Desmus is Titus. The, the plural is Titi. According to tradition, apparently, uh, Dumachus, the, 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 the bad thief, is, is one of the band of robbers who assaults Joseph and the rest of the Holy Fam as they're running out of Egypt uh, as well. So again, I like Apocrypha where, like, where people have posited where the, where the other connections were. We met in passing so many times and we are woven into the same story stuff. I like the insistence that it's mistranslation because there's no punctuation. So therefore, I mean, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Like, where is the comma? So is it Jesus saying, I'm saying to you today, which why would he say that? You will be in paradise. I think it's interesting too, because I, the name is very common in, in Spanish and Portuguese culture as Dimas. It's my great grandfather's name. There is a city also in Los Angeles called San Dimas, which is actually named for the valley that's behind it, which was a thief hideout amongst other things. But Dimas or Diamas, as it's sometimes transliterated, I don't know why, but seems to be often incorrectly transcribed as DMS and so just DMS is a fairly common name and again the, owing to this penitent thief and it's a common name in 
Mexico, just from doing research uh, amongst heavy indigenous populations. So there's something about this saint that stood out to people that were not in the money, had no access to certain things that the peninsular class, that the, the upper classes had. And so there's, there's something interesting that certainly in the central uh, valley of Mexico and, and those areas, you have a lot of, everybody's named after Mary, of course. And it, so a lot of people's first names are Joseph, Maria, Jose, but the middle names coming out, Inmas and, and, and Luz and other things, Mary of this and Mary of that. Dimas is a is an interesting saint for just the fact that he's he seems an unlikely saint. It's not one that'd be like, oh, who are you named after? Like, oh yeah, that thief that died for Jesus, as opposed to like a dragon slayer or an empire builder or all these other things. Yeah, exactly. Like he, one of the few that comes from the the, the Sadie of his mouth, right? As he said. Also, if I don't know if anybody else is a fan of the Uncharted series, but there is this beautiful cross that's used in the last one that was uh, about like the finding the pirates' paradise and all those other things. But Demas being like the pirates' chosen saint of like we could still be good, we could still find and create a utopia free from the sovereign bullshit and the classism, and like how do we turn this around? Demas is this was is often portrayed with the arms tied behind him. Like he's bound even more so that the T-bar of the crucifixion is actually, his hands are bound behind him and it's, it looks inevitably much more painful than the touchdown of Jesus pose. Caught fish this big, yeah. And, and do you think that's primarily what it's about, showing a uh, distinction between Christ and, and Dismas? I think that's the case in iconography. It's just, it's helpful to, if you see a single person crucified, they're going to be Jesus. Right. And that there's these distinctions of like other people. It, Dismas is, is crucified, Peter's crucified upside down. Andrew is right. crucified on the Andrew cross, not on the Roman cross. So it, this, the heraldry of the saints is important for recognizing them. So yeah. I think there's that. It's quite yeah. important. And you see that played out in, in, in certain Gomorrah constructions, the, uh, the, the lodestone that's, that's used in one of the Verum's book of supernatural secrets for unlocking, actual uh, opening locks is a, take a lodestone and pass it in the manner of St. Andrew's cross, it says. So like this X shape. So yeah, they, they also be, end up becoming ritual instructions and gestures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it seems good to, to, to go from there to talk a little bit about the Armour Christi as well. I mean, we can always circle back to more thief mysteries. We have a bunch more. Mystery. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, know. this is like the shortest, like, it's not because we don't know much about his life. Like he appeared at the right time in the right place and said the right thing and he became a saint, which is probably more historical basis or as much historical basis than any other saint before the 1600s. Yeah. Yes. And this, this sense of, yeah, of resignation of like, it's a fair cop, right? We did do the thing. Like, this isn't, this may be a horrible punishment, but like by the laws and, and so on, this is not um, undeserved as opposed to this good man and, and maybe Messiah. Yeah. There's some, some interesting themes around like soteriology there, I think. So Dismas's cross turns up. We're talking about like how he's bound, but it, it, the, the cross itself turns up without him on it, without him, the, the crucifix version of him in the Arma Christi, right? The, 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 the weapons of Christ or the, the instruments of the passion. Yeah. And those are typically, so the, the, first of all, there's not a, a stand. Am I, am I right in saying that there isn't, that there are several standard like versions of how many tools and what they are? Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I would say that there are landmark ones that are almost never forgotten, but right. certainly there are extras based on how intricate your artist is or <laughs> how rich your parish is. Um, right. or so in of, brief, yeah, in brief, these look to me like the heraldry of Christ and specifically the heraldry of his passion, of his crucifixion. So, so his cross is obviously the main focus, but then we also usually, I would say that the crosses of the wicked thief Gestas and, and the penitent thief Dismas are, are also pretty core cool to this wider array of up to like 22, 30 odd different tools or representations of a particular instance or event in the ongoing passion, right? Yeah, they are the, they're the physical markers that this event happened. So it is, it's one thing to talk about it as a mythological, as a, and I don't use that term as a denigration at all, but as a truth that someone might believe in or find inspiration in or read about and find moving but to have physical proof, which is, is 
part of course for how the how especially the, the Roman Catholic Church evolved of making sure that there was a physical church that could then cite its authority from God as to why it, it, it had to have to make you know, the entire world. And the Arma Christi are like the seeds of that in many ways. Like they, they are the weapons. You could they metaphorically become the weapons that Christ uses to fight the devil and therefore all saints use to fight the devil. The, 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 the sign of the cross or the Holy Spear or the veil of Veronica held up can cause a demon to leave a person or can cause someone to confess or to reveal that if you make a cross out of palm leaves on Palm Sunday, they're like, if this is floated, it will point towards the, 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 the person who's telling the truth. Or conversely, in some folk magic, converse to, point to the person who's lying. And so like you have these weird folk magics that evolve from making manifest physically the, the story of the passion. They're the props, right? They're the repertoire. So if you're going to do the nativity crash every year, like your major becomes imbued with everybody who's ever played baby Jesus or every baby doll that's ever played baby Jesus. Or like that Raising Hope episode where baby Jesus gets stolen. And yeah, there's other things that happen in that episode too, which is the idea of that things build up grace in the same way that we would talk about that in other magical systems of there's a certain virtue that is built up by these things having, and also the notion of relics themselves of these are, we want to talk about first class relics, like other than maybe that footprint of St. Michael in Italy, Mm -hmm. like we're talking son of God relics. And that's more than we're going to get at any other time. Right. That's big cash. The the, uh, creme de la creme relic business, right? Pieces of the one true cross. Similar to our discussion on St. Blaise would be like, if we assemble all the pieces of the one true cross, like (laughs) we're going to rival those Midwestern preachers on a hill crosses. Um, (laughs) It's going to be like, it's going to hit the moon. And you thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to bow Godzilla. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Kaiju Christ. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, if only Ed Hathaway could play Jesus for me. But it's also uh, just... A note of things that's because it's in our own iconography for for, for radio free with the, that the slant on the bottom of the orthodox cross is actually representative of the good thief and the bad thief so the it is always going up towards the right jesus is right in that way yes jesus is right uh, jesus is dexter not uh, not our sinister I, I i love that as well yeah the old don't trust the lefty it's it's, it's his right hand right yeah, I found that that fascinating as well. Yeah, the facing that he is, he's, well, he's, he's happy he's to talk to He's at the father's right hand. So the thief is at his right hand, symbolically. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. also I like what you you bring up of like, certainly Jesus' cross is obviously one of the Arma Christi, but the, the trio of crosses is Golgotha. Like if we see three crosses, this is Golgotha. So it, it's interesting in the like the various, even if we take it to the markings of the Magi, of the chalk markings some of us are adamant that it doesn't make sense i mean four crosses it's fine but like also it's either got to be five crosses or three it's like four crosses doesn't quite make sense in the organization like make one a star put some other crosses in put some but like even if there's three crosses in something it is always going to to have gold with the present certain things just make more sense canonically catholically in that way right right and the wide not just I mean, it, it's a, in theory, all sorts of people were crucified, right? So across, yeah, even with a, a guy on it that we generally identify as, as what Jesus looked like and, and, and shifting conceptions of that or contested, I should say. Yeah, with the three, with there's a wider sense of the Golgotha mysteries, uh, the wider, not just the passion itself, but also uh, Adam's skull underneath and all that, yeah, the, the, mm-hmm. who, whose skull that is the place of. Yeah, so this is a nice one, like for us in terms of like, this is, this is, uh, this is partly why the, the meeting place that we, the, what, what we call our meeting place as well. And we all know damn well that we're both the good thief and the bad thief at all times. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Every <laughs> moment of crucifixion in our minds. Oh, blessed plagiary. Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. This is, this is, of course, yeah, we are, we are all self-flagellating and self-flagellating. <laughs> but the, so I, the Arma Christi are fascinating because they go through local permutations and where someone might not know because the Bible doesn't necessarily say the details of something, it gets filled in. So like the whip, which we would know the Romans used a cat of night tails where they had metal stars embedded into it, becomes a, a, a fairly standard Northern European birch bundle. And this isn't one of the armor Christi. So the fact is that when you beat your children for the birch stick, you're using the weapon of Christ to beat the devil out of them. For a lovely Lenormand card as well. But I think they have this. Sponge and lance become very like the most common, right? The sponge, the lance, the crown of thorns, 
a, a cat of nine tails or a whip of some sort. Usually the column is common, but it's, if it has, and like, especially if anybody's familiar with like modern lithographic seven day candles, Nevada candles, which are really meant to be nine day candles, but uh, good luck finding that. But the rooster is usually on top of the column, which is holding Veronica's veil as well in a lot of those like just judge candles. Obviously the nails, which vary in number depending on tradition. And we now we go, there were three nails or four nails, depending on where you are in history and time and whether you're Orthodox or Catholic or whatever. But that's the main ones. There's a lot more past that because anything that gets mentioned in the gospel passages and anything that you could think of that might be associated with something that was mentioned in the gospel passages, like the pinchers to remove the nails. Like, why is this so important? But it also lays up blacksmiths and it, the tool. all those tools are heavily blacksmith oriented. And that speaks to its own like message of smithy mysteries in, in medieval Europe, especially in Germany, where the armor Christi are so, so revered. Yeah, yeah. The pincers and the ladder are particularly interesting to me in terms of like, I, 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 I like those are the things you would need to actually crucify someone, right? That that yeah. sense of like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 like the actual tool, not just the stuff that's mentioned in it. In it, I, I also love that stuff, like the dice that the Roman soldiers used to divide his stuff up by lot, are sometimes included, and I love that, like the the, the hagiograph, the hagiographic heraldry of that. But I also love that there's a certain practicality of like, if you are going to nail a man to a thing. Here is what you're going to need for that. That's it. it uh, in term, yeah, yeah. The, the, again, these are icons to meditate on, right, and to understand Christ's passion. Um, it's also like it, it starts to play to the ex-voto traditions of offering little things to a significance because you do see ears heavily in there. Sometimes even lips for the kiss. And basically, mm-hmm. the timeline is going to be anything from Judas's kiss all the way through the crucifixion and the removal of the body and the resurrection. So you get the myrrh bearers. So you get the, the vessels of myrrh that myrrh bearers were going to use. And you get the face that is literally spitting, like sputum coming out of the lips or lips by themselves, which represent Judas's kiss. Sometimes lips with a fig hanging out of it, which is Judas's kiss because of the, the crucifixion or the hanging from the fig tree that happens. The robe, all the, the sometimes the cup of the last supper is there along with the, the, the bread, but this is a little bit weird in the timeline. But it's also mm-hmm. come up catches Jesus's blood in Joseph of Arimathea's hands at the crucifixion. So, like, what is representational as a timeline versus what is representational as like, if Jesus says, "This is my blood," does it have to be literal? With like, does someone have to bring the cup the next day and catch his blood in it? But for an iconography, it's like, no, that is that makes sense as to why you do that. But I think it's very hard. When you are from, this is what worldview is. We don't realize we're filling in the details of somebody else's, that they wouldn't have the same look thing when they look at this. Is it a duck or a rabbit? Right. Um, and I think a lot right. of that happens with these tools. And that instantiation that like it's a birch uh, a bundle of set of switches in, in German, Germanic regions especially is also like, again, this, this sense of, of timelessness to this, right? We don't, we're not just talking about a historical event. There's a sense that like, there's a meditation on like, what if this happened tomorrow? So, like, one of my, one of my favorites is that is the lance. So that we've mentioned that as Longinus, Longinus, however, I like to say that. Which is one big big more. Uh, Longinus, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Which is the, yeah. Uh, and uh, Longinus is uh, interesting. Again, sometimes sainted, uh, having also potentially been blinded uh, by wounding Christ on the side with the, with the lance or the spear. And it's also an interesting one to me that like, the yeah, in, in, in Christ's suffering, even not even not just in Christ's suffering, but in in inflicting Christ's suffering, you might also come to understand a different position for yourself and and repent on certain things. I mean, that, really that goes right into the "Am I He, Rabbi?" like Gospel of Matthew of each of them asking, like, "Am I the one that betrayed you?" Like, they don't, they're so worried that, like, wait, did I do something that I just didn't think about? And like, and he says, "Better it be for he, for him that he had never been born." which is pretty condemning. But the, the interpretation of that from like many people's perspective, yes, it could say that he's con- saying that Judas is cursed for all eternity or also just like he is going to suffer. Right. As in his own ways, he will suffer hugely because of this, not just for the literalism of like if he betrayed Christ, but even from the, if they were the one, if he was the one that they were in cahoots and plotted it out together to make sure the word was spread, like the, to bear the, I mean, this is one of the people in the mouth of the devil. By the time we get to, to Inferno, right? 
This is, mm-hmm. this is this is a big thing as opposed to like is he his best friend? Are there shadows there of the Luciferian betrayal of mm. of Iblis defending Allah's like oneness at all at a significant personal cost to him? And what that is and what's the battle between orthodoxy and orthopraxy and literalism versus figurativism and hubba dubba hit. All yeah. the, these cute little like trading cards of early Christianity known mm-hmm. as Armour Christi. I think it's fascinating too that certain of the Armour Christi, because of their prominence in churches, do get secretized in Afro Caribbean things hugely. The various roads of Obatala in, in, in Cuba. Um, especially Obamoro, who is the suffering Jesus or, and others that are secretized with different parts of the crucifixion mythos or the Via Dolorosa, that the, the latter is always going to be associated with the Arma Christi, that it's advancement and it's going up to take Christ down. And, and in some ways in the meditations, in that lovely Jesuit way of like, as you take Christ down, what is it like to be there? But as you take Christ down from the cross, you replace his body with your own. Hey. And like exactly what you're saying, there is something even in participating in this. What is there? It's that thing of uh, we've talked about this of when you're, you're working with a client, and they're they're talking to you about a dream or a nightmare in which something is chasing them, and you're seeing it happen, and then you see the thing in the dream turn and look at you, mm-hmm. and it's like ah, something else. Mm-hmm. It's all you can do this memory of a dream. You're like shit, shit, this is bad. Um, yeah, but yeah, what is it? What is it? How many saints and mystics very much go into this? The Arma Christi becomes the another rosary, the man of sorrows, the a rosary of pain. The, mm. Like, how can I have things that remind me of this significant, pivotal moment in in Jesus's life? Yeah, and that this moment is itself also keyed into, as we started off, like, if not time mysteries, then at least astronomical mysteries in terms of the eclipse and the fact that the sun and the moon are sometimes themselves, but also represented in the Arma Christi. Yes. Very much so. And that the 30 pieces of silver become like the stars. So you see, they look like stars at first, but they're actually coins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of that happens. So and then the body parts is what I was trying to recount earlier, because I know you have, in addition to the wound, so you'll sometimes see a wounded hand, a wounded foot, and the crown of thorns. But you'll also see the wound to the side that looks like a floating vagina. You'll see the ear, which is Peter's having cut off the ear of one of the people who come to assail Christ in the garden. You'll see the lips, either as the Judas kiss or the lips spitting, which is the mockery of Christ. You'll see hands that are not, if it doesn't have a wound, it's the hand that slapped Christ um, and shoved him and pushed him. Right. So there's quite a bit of body parts going on here. Uh, They call that when you, the practice of taking, like you have a a gammy leg, so you make like a wax leg and bring it to to a holy place as an ex photo, right? Yeah, milagro. Yeah, miracle is what it is. This is, you do one before, right? It's that constant divide, at least in in Mexican folklore, between the tributa and the manda, that like your one is appealing, one is given in appealing, and one is given in, I, you did this for me and I must return and give it to you. So this is, you could compare it to, those lovely authors of the 90s, they would say like, it is it is better to do metal versions of things for spirits. But like, if you don't, like start with paper and then if they do something good for you, give them wax. And then if wax, if they do something good with that, then maybe give them like wood and then go from there and from the wood, make, maybe have something engraved. But you know, and also it's a lot to start off with engraved sigils of demons. You're like, I could torture you a lot longer. Yeah, and then you're into all sorts of potential for like some cost fallacy and things like that. I spent so much on these ritual tools. I must be doing something right. Which something maybe no, maybe all the grimoires were written by ritual tool makers. <laughs> <laughs> that's the real Illuminati here. That's that's, yeah. that's the mercurial <laughs> side of this Arthur Christie now. The black handled math that mafia. <laughs> yeah, well I, I I do remember what was his name? He lived in Williamsburg, he dressed like a banker. You were in the chaos magic circles of the late nineties. You were a really cool guy. Can't remember you, but uh, can't remember your name. But he made a herm out of the pillar with with Jesus on top with the veil of Veronica. So it was the herm, and then he used a cock's head coming out where the penis would be because it was the cock that that crows. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it, you had to be very Catholic to even understand what's going on there. Which was funny. Like you put a spear and a sponge behind a column that has a man's face and like a cock on it mm-hmm. and he's like oh it's totally a crucifixion herm 
That's fantastic. <laughs> and it's the type of thing that you either have to be really stone drunk or extremely Catholic to get. Or all three. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's glorious. Also the assemblage of it as well, right? It's not just, I mean, you can, you, but it seems that you know, each of the tools has a story behind it and therefore a particular meditation to it potentially. And, and even as we've been discussing some like outright sorcerous uses, but it's, again, it's about the assemblage of them to an extent as well. Like that is also like, like you say, like to put a spear and a sponge next to a coal, like this accruing, this acquiring, this putting things together, the assemblage. Which I think is part of the reason why it's so revered into like expert wood carvers of Germany and, and, and Spain, because you had to plan it out so well in order to make things continue to stay realistic as you overlapped and put things between. And it's definitely one of those figures where things just go all over the place scale wise. It turns into like the movie Cats a little bit sometimes of like, why is this sword bigger than the, the cross or why is this ear bigger than the column that you just like it just but that's you need to be able to tell what it is yeah yeah okay. it's not it's it's not proportionally represented you need to know what that is it's, yeah it is also i think there's a lot of the it does reference in some ways even though the body of christ is not necessarily part of the arma christi that it does reference in some ways the 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 charts of the zodiacal man and just anything that maps things with lots of little other things this emblematic art that for the illiterate is this is there's so much information to be gleaned and for the literate probably uh, i don't mean to put it just upon the literate but thank god this is one of those examples where trying to convey something through an image to people that can't read ends up benefiting those that can in the same way let's like the the dip and the sidewalk right that that, that was meant for wheelchairs but now everybody uses that as the exit off the sidewalk into the streets it's or like the louvre builds its ele- an elevator and the staircase goes around it's beautiful but it's done that way so that it's you are included and you don't have to go around the back entrance into something of understanding that sometimes being inclusive of your intended audience benefits everybody. Um, mm. And the, I think the, there's something to that with these emblems and the, and the diagrams that do happen. It's not just illustrating the stations of the cross. It's having a person. There's also this like not hidden images nature to it, but definitely a bit of like, it's a game of like trying to remember what each thing is in it. And when you see a carbon, it'd be like, do I know what that, what is that one right there? Oh, that's supposed to be a sponge. That's a terrible sponge. Because other sponges are really hard to do. It's an anatomization, is how early modern authors, I think, would put it. Uh, that becomes very popular with like anatomy of melancholy, anatomy of sorcery, by now, those kinds of things. Yeah, that, that in anatomization, you are exactly, you're able to, to show the piece and its mysteries, but also how it connects up to other pieces. The skin of the thing that is both container and connector. And again, the fact that like they could be actual assemblages or they could be a single, like carved out of a single thing but yep. representing this great cornucopia plurality. Oh, certainly in the assemblage, right? Like you can, you can have a family coat of arms that, that then has the sponge and the spear behind it. And we know that just means that like you did something significant for a church in town or that the sponge and the spear become heraldry at other times for like, is that God the Father or is that Jesus? And it's if angels are holding a spear and a and sponge, then we know that that's Jesus being represented. Especially in Orthodox art, I believe, where it's often the arm of Christ here associated with the throne, the throne of judgment, heavily, to be like, he's coming back. Remember the state we left him in last time? Wasn't so good. Electric Boogaloo 2 is happening. Um, right. Sword, yeah. It yeah. maybe doesn't want to say Oh my God, God. it's totally like a Voltron. Like all these things assembled to make the new body of Christ. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, it's mine. Oh, <laughs> Why do you have two left ears? That's the only ones available. <laughs> I had one more point that I wanted to make about the Dharma um, Christie, which is the, the two hyssop plants that are growing from the ground. Uh-huh. And in, in a bunch of work I, I ended up doing on looking at how hyssop might be connected to what is called marjoram sometimes uh-huh. through archaeobotany and the labyrinthine trails of one plant being called several things and several things being called one plant. And sometimes, and again, with spirits, sometimes the name is an epithet and describes the thing that grows in the shady place, etc. But there is this, the, but his, and it's, it's Psalm 51 business of, of cleansing. Uh, you white was also explicitly about cleansing after a death. And I found that really an interesting piece there between like older Jewish customs and uh, purification practices and the Christ. I'm remembering some images of, of Arma Christi that are like freestanding as well. So you, hmm. you get the the kind of, if you, if you travel anywhere in Europe, there's going to be town centers that do have a cross that is going to have, oftentimes a shield 
that'll have the armor Christi upon them, or at least the face of the base of the cross will have many things or the cross itself. But there are freestanding ones that end up being like modern Herms in a way of mm-hmm. like, this is a guaranteed road that you're going from one city that has a prominent church to another city that has a prominent church, or that these certain markers of heraldry, uh, whether it be of saints or the armor Christi themselves, are, are ways of finding your way in the darkness. And there's something quite moving to that. And it overlaps with other things because I like the fact that we're going from Dismas to Armor Christi, which are a Good Friday thing. But we're still talking about the Annunciation Day itself, whether or not we're even mentioning the Annunciation. But the, what are the, then conversely, what are the tools of the incarnation? What are the tools of the conception? Like the, the, the kid, the trumpet of Gabriel, the hand on the belly of Mary. Is it Elizabeth's voice with John the Baptist fetus? be one of the tombs of the Armor Christi of the Incarnation because he was present, right? He leaps and therefore Elizabeth knows that Mary is, oh, here, which is right after the actual Annunciation and the Incarnation, all these things. But like, come on, story-wise, we've got, we need some props to show you who's who. Yeah, we've already got a prayer in, in front of the Ave Maria, which is also the Annunciation, right? Yeah. We, are, we are echoing the words of Gabriel. Like, oh. so yeah, we've got a- Gabriel and Elizabeth. Right, it's blurred. Right. Already, it's blurred. Perfect example of why in my head it's blurred. Because it is, because <laughs> because my memory is blurry as well. Um, again, like again, like history. I will, yeah, absolutely jump on the let's let's kick the shit out of positivism or historicist positivism. Like things aren't always inevitably and only getting better and more civilized. We remember and we forget, and when we forget that we remember and forget, we we, we leave ourselves very open to to being lied to, <laughs> <laughs> especially by ourselves. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, mm-hmm. Stuff deception yeah. is the good deception. That's the good. <laughs> that's that's the, the the stealing from ourselves. Yes, <laughs> or not mm-hmm. could be could be a lovely reward. Depends on how far into the dementia you go. Which is interesting in the sense that, like, okay, uh, really unstandard order to like segue into things. But it, I've been thinking about Themis a lot in regards to the justice card. And Themis is more than just justice, right? Because it's often depicted as or said to be Themis on the card. And although there's not, I mean, because that's who we associate as the tightness of justice. But this concept around Themis is more than just justice. It also implies custom, mores, social truths, worldview itself. The thing that kind of corrals you to a common end and movement forward. And and that's fascinating in the sense of like the Arma Christi have our folk tradition, folk reverence, things that goad you into the role of like becoming like or Jesus like in that way. There's yeah, some, in some way engaging or even like partic- uh, engaging in a participation of that event. Yeah. That mythic thing. Yeah. So I just I'm wondering like the as the organizer of communal affairs, as the or- therefore like I would have Themis would be present in group worship. Themis would be present in any time two or three are assembled in not her name, mm-hmm. but also associated with oracles and prophecies. And like, she is the scales of justice, but there's just something so fascinating about that. And like, consider the second wife of Zeus. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem a, 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 a justice imposed top down, right? It seems like ethos, right? Sense of like, what is the, the, what are the, the back to like shared values, right? Value centers. If not shared, then like, what can we, where, where do we go conceptually to agree and disagree about these things? And these points become crossroads of inter- exchange and, and, and argument and, uh, and, and conflict and things. Even the notion of like the, Chris, the Christian ideal of like Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Themis is not wrathful. Mm-hmm. Themis is not vengeful. If you ignore her, then Nemesis comes in. But Nemesis is the wrathful retribution. Themis is blind justice. It's just, this is the way it is. This is the way it's going to move forward, which is, we often think of like, give me your judgment. But when we talk about blind judgment in that way, the idea is you weigh the facts, which contrary to, as we were discussing earlier, modern interpretation, facts are not changeable. Truth can be changeable. Absolutely. But like facts are their own thing. Content. Ideally, a fact only requires one tongue to uh, uh, enunciate it, or yes. some truths require infinite context uh, to change the the validity of facts. But but yeah, so it, it's just there's something when invoking justice, and especially like the idea of someone wanting justice for something that has been they've been wronged, and what does this card mean? 
as a tarot card because it's also starting off in the traditional order, like the second set of of things. We're not about the rulers anymore. We're talking, yeah. we're starting to talk about virtues heavily uh, out of this second set of cards. Second octave. Eight. Is it seven cards? Eight. That's eight. But this is interesting because mm-hmm. justice is, is, a, is, a, is a tricky thing. And then it's depicted with both sword and scale. Yeah. And, I, and thinking about the scale uh, as well, if we want to end up talking about like justice versus adjustment uh, as well in, in, in the thought, but the, the notion of not just weighing things up, not just that there are also the literal kind of shape of that and the three crosses again, and that you have the, the one that weighs well and the one that weighs badly, but in whatever form that is, whether you're trying to, to, to weigh the, the heavier or the lighter one. And also this sense that we, I don't know, that the justice is a, a balancing act between the good and the bad. Again, heavy scare quotes around those. And that we have to be able to understand, we have to have both close and understand both in order to, to recognize them and to navigate between them, maybe. I like this uh, scales as Golgotha right there is fascinating, right? The, 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 what you're talking about, like the good thief, bad thief tilt with the, mm-hmm. the scales are literally themselves a cross that is being held in the hand. Um, yep. It's fast. That's beautiful. And then again, the cross of the sword. Yep, there's some shit there. And then the rider weight being like this kingly, by modern standards, perhaps non-binary, but it, it seems to imply kingship. There's no mm-hmm. uh, feminine markers other than the page boy hair. Uh, right. No, um, but it's, yeah. And, and again, how do we determine if this is Lady Justice, usually by the, the blindfold, right? Yes. And it's, and in this, by the time we get to Rider Waite, it is not viewed as a, a feminist like figure. And mm-hmm. looking at Marseille based, it certainly is. It, it is very much justice coming with sword and scales, and it is decidedly female. And there's something that has changed here. It's the, one of the few cards that I, in the name changes or the common parlances of, I actually like the word adjustment, mm-hmm. right? There's something there that it describes it as it's not just about a decree from on high, which the right away kind of the image makes it feel a little bit like that. Like mm-hmm. some, somebody that's in state that's like our, to quote the Obara thing of the king does not lie, meaning because the king is above truth. The, one, the king is the one that says what truth is. You cannot lie. Like, yeah, yeah, like it's literally it, what the king says goes. So there's this a little bit of this kind of imbalance uh-huh, there and this in this justice card of like, I don't trust this figure to be part impartial. I trust a lot of the Marseille ladies, even though they're not always blindfolded. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. More often than not, they are not. I think the Crowley quote about it, or the, the one that's described at least, when you take tarot classes, is that he says, uh, the universe isn't fair, but isn't necessarily fair, but it is precise. Uh, so again like uh, this navigation of like expecting again expecting god to save you because you're good right prove it prove your goodness by by giving me more salvation cake slash get me off this damn cross is a little different right there's i mean the scale is made of gold which is supposed to signify its virtue and its honesty and it's it's in you know a balanced decision but like as incorruptibility king's hand like it's a little bit I, and mm-hmm. it's being held correctly, right? So that you can't influence it. That's the whole point of having this, the mechanisms that are what they are. And I also find it fascinating, right? That adjustment, given that this card was moved around. So this card was fucked with by, by the Golden Dawn and then gets fucked again <laughs> uh, repeatedly. So it's in a weird position, uh, starting with the rider weight and then like people restore it back to its original position or keep it in the new one or all these things. It is, it is heavily adjusted. Right. It moved with Libra was mm-hmm. the whole point. Because no other sign could ever be about justice because every other sign's relationship to a card must include a literalism like a scale. And in that, that halfway point, right, between the, if we're not, I'm, I'm not confusing actual time and, 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 and ritual time, I hope, but at the point between Jesus's, between the start of Jesus's mission and the, the end of it all the way, if you take millennia, millenarian standards way off in the future at this point of like, the halfway point between things, judging what's to come and what's uh, what's happened. Something about the halfway being a, a metonym of the whole, of knowing what's coming, right? Which is another big part of the the passion. It's not, it's that whole like curse of sentience is awareness of mortality stuff, as well as like, do you fulfill the the prophecy? What's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> now my brain's going on the permutations of like the obviousness of like, okay, yes, I'm grabbing Leo to the strength card, which switching justice and the Leo card the Leo card, the strike card or the lust card because of those obvious things. But there's something really beautiful. Imagining what justice would be like under the influence of Leo. Mm. 
and that thing that roars forward, like it, there's just a way there's like, life will out type of thing of like, and that's like the, the truth of it all. And the, there's also a lack of indecision that is under a Leonine influence that is beautiful. Or the, or, the, fi- the fixity of fire as well, right? Like, like yeah, that's called the sun as opposed to Aries's torch. But like this, this central thing that, uh, under which there is nothing new. Or even the the, the Libra like aspects of the strength card is quite interesting too. Like, who's going to win? And right, right. I feel cheated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, you flip around, you flip them all around, and you you write a book on the other secret mysteries of tarot. Uh, yeah. We've had discussions about what that is, Al. <laughs> yes, we have. Do you want to seek clarification uh, for myself or anyone else at this point? <laughs> I spent a lot of time like staring at the adjustment card, and I, I really like those kind of lattices of the, I can't remember the term for it, but the way you can produce a curve by connecting up straight lines into a, a thing that like charts a, a curve by its, by its latticing. I'm not maybe explaining that very well. But the difference between the adjustment cards having this sense of like, the arc of the, the scales being informed by all of these vectors of points between things that it is emerging out of a, a fabric of, what do you call it, like social or interpersonal or political. It's, it's woven out of something. This was really interesting to me and in just staring at it, trying to, trying to, trying to vibe it out, which is also, you know, a common feature of, uh, of, of about how the, the Thoth Tarot was, was, was drawn in general with those emphases and de-emphases. Uh, I, 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 I dig it. <laughs> Part of you just hears in Latin, justice begins with an I. <laughs> uh, which is a horrible so thing to say it out loud, right? <laughs> that, does, that, is, that is very Samuel L. Jackson quoting Ezekiel, right? <laughs> <laughs> just a little. I know there's time for that too. Oh uh, yeah, justice and Justina and, and yeah. the just. Mm. But the cross being the sign, the, the sign of the cross being a sword as well, depending on whether you're holding it, blade or upright. Fascinating there, right? Of the sword being where, like, and therefore the the balance being well, uh, like, is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Of the yeah, holding it upright aloft, like into battle once more. Right? Yeah, Hank and Co. Versus yeah, holding it, the woman girt with sword, right? If it, if it downwards is is tracing the the form of Guella instead. Yeah. yeah. Even the idea of the two, of like something on each side, and then ultimately the sword blade being a mimic of the which way is it going to show? Like the exaggerated, like which one pointing towards which balance is winning? This fascinating. There are oh, sorry, that- is where uh, it's two faced, if I remember correctly, two of justice. Like both are blindfolded in some French decks. Oh, so we got Janice thing coming in. Yeah, but also think it's just listening to each side, right? Listening mm-hmm. to each side objectively and how that goes. And mm. sometimes, if I remember correctly, the one card has like multi, like each body has scales. I don't remember if there's a sword at play, but I remember there being multiple scales in, in the hands. So like weighing each side there, it comes into play, which is, there's a quality being listened to that when it comes to justice, when it comes to Themis, when it comes to like what serves the, the social fabric and how does that balance out? And do we call the Arenes? Do we call Nemesis? Do we, what, who do we call? What, when do we go to war when the scale tips in that way? But we don't just go to war because one person says. Right. Justice is not the same as punishment, but, but at some points it is going to have to call in that sometimes. So uh, Valfire is, is a duke, is a, has a couple of aliases that are pretty established and most of the time in, in the office of this, this devil, they, they give the, the full alias Valfire or, or Malifar, along with a bunch of other things that I wouldn't call aliases so much just the result of not having standardized spelling. So Valfar, Valfur, Valfour. That is interesting to me to mention because we have the root of the end there. Which again, we might be engaging in our own onomastic speculation here, but fur is one of the, the words for thief. That's, it's one of the, the Latinate. It's where we get furted from to act in it in, like, like a thief does. And so, but let's start with original stuff. Original stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the multiple language things go there. Cause if it's Malifar, which is one of the variants, right? Then it's bad thief. And if it's Valifar, Vale means 
okay, it's Spanish. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. Mm-hmm. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, it, so Scott starts by saying Valifar alias Malifar is a strong duke coming forth in the shape of a lion and the head of a thief, which is interesting. We don't get a lot of, uh, mm, that's not true. Th- this idea of what, what does it, what does the thief's head look like, right? Not a, not a thievish looking person necessarily, or maybe that's what it's implying or not something like a king who would assume a crown is in place. So we're already in an interesting place of like, what, how, how do we, what, what does that, what is that referring to? It's definitely referring to something, right? He is very familiar with them to whom he maketh himself acquainted, says, translate Scott, till he hath brought them to the gallows, is how, is how Scott puts it. And, and it's said to rule 10 legions uh, at that point. So going back to the original Vea text and, 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 and scratching my head against my terrible high school Latin was really, was interesting for me because we get a lot of discussion. It does seem they are at least at the term is capite yatronis, lower lateros. Again, depending on whether or not it's an I or an L, because again, confusions. But that does, that is like the genitive of like, refers to the head of a plunderer, a robber, brigand, a bandit. By the time we get to, uh, so weight ends up translating that, a dead weight ends up translating that with the head of a hunter or a thief. And, and attributes that. Oh, a hunter could have a rough app and I'd recognize him right away. Right, right. So what are we doing there? And I think there's some, if not the actual word itself being used, but like consider raptor as both hunter and uh, uh, plunderer is I think the thing there, like that which that which takes, that which strikes. Eject because it seems like as good a place as any <laughs> best folk names ever for the Kestrel, which I sent to you, like the oh, oh, yeah. Tucker. Like, yeah, it's your fantastic names for a bird. And that people tried to say, no, it's sucker. And it's like, no, it was fucker. It clearly is the F. It, 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 F, F. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So wind sucker would make so much less sense. It is observed that like when they hover, they yeah. move in a particular way that looks like they're, they're getting down uh, yeah. with the wind. Yeah. Damn. Well, I mean, all this, this, this cultural coding that fuck is a bad word um, because it still is in my head. I still think light is going to strike me. So it, well, it, it is now. Like, I mean, that's the light that you should <laughs> think. Yes. <laughs> That's the thing about it shifting, right? Like that even before formal Victorian boulderization, this notion of fuck it, as a ribald term in the same way of like, oh, again, ass, are you allowed to say that on American television now or not? Like the shifting of like what counts as uh, a little cheeky or a little like familiar versus like outright dropping the the, the C-bomb, which is a lot bigger deal uh, over here. I mean, like think, the, I can't see your etymology through cultural contextualization going on. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, well, you so, know, in ancient times, it was fine to say fucking ass. You're like, right. yes. And you're saying it in front of a room full of grandmas. We're now calling cops. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Context is king. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yes, looking at how people have tried to like reverse that, that yeah, claiming that the, it's not actually an F, it's one of those fancy pre-modern big uh, S's. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So there's no point where the thief the head of a thief or a hunter just becomes an ass because that is why the because the donkey's head does become one of those proposed. That's what Mathers says. Yeah, that's what, that's where I was going with this. Like, I'm not sure where Mathers is getting this from, honestly. Right, Falafor, he's a mighty duke. He appeareth in the shape of a lion with an ass's head, bellowing. Oh, the bellowing part is is also uh, bah, 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 bah. head of a thief or barking. That might be a ass translated differently. Or when there's a, I, I haven't found the exact typo or or change in office because again i don't want to ascribe all of this to ignorant human error there's a sense that sometimes the spirit turns up with something different and it's not just a mistranslation of something that's because the spirit seems to have turned up differently for that grimoire writer or clark or i really like the, these woodcuts that are not true to the descriptions as well though there's something i really wish they showed up like this instead of just more abstract forms that are tend to be more common in modern discussions of them I will say it's been my experience, and I think we've hinted at this before, that like the books of the Offices of Spirits, the earlier forms of their their appearance, tend to have some heraldry to them that I've found consistent when talking to other people who have worked with those spirits. They, those seem to be a bit more consistent than the later Mathers translations, for instance. So what you're saying is that if I don't see it, I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> that's what I'm adding. Well, yes, that's that's exactly what I'm, I'm saying. I have a secret. tilted the scales of justice and have made a condemnation yep. of my personal practice. I, I have a shit list. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you don't exactly see what I saw, then you're obviously doing it wrong. <laughs> and my grimoire dad can be a real grimoire dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, but that's not un- unfortunately an uncommon occurrence. Sadly not. 
Is it the bellowing or barking that, that leads perhaps to the donkey? I think so. Yeah. I, 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 it's a reverse justification for the materiality of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. There are other points of the mangrove chimney. There are other points of transmutation in this translation of the relics of the offices as well with Valafar Malafar in terms of, so, so Scott gives us this notion of like, he's very familiar with them who make it with whom he, he makes himself acquainted till he hath brought them to the gallows. And that gallows, this sense of, again, punitive capital justice is also equated with a trap. It said he's a good familiar that tempteth them. He is familiar of to steal. That's, that's what Mathis says. His seal is this, which is to be worn, whether thou have him as familiar or not. Of uh, uh, Weight translates Vea saying he shows friendship to his familiars till they are caught in the trap. So we have again these terms that are be that the grammar is being slightly shifted. Very like uh, I say to you, comma today you will be in paradise. Slash I say to you today, comma. So again, these consistent pieces of it, these consistent instruments of the office are, are rearticulated in a variety of ways, and in I think in ways that try and make them make more sense. And that's what I, I see is, is a lot of individual translators and workers attempting to again attempting to, to synthesize the the library and the crossroads, right? The archive and the repertoire. It's funny because t- we talk about personal experiences and things like this. And Balafar is a, <laughs> I, I look back through collective note, notebooks and things like that. Sometimes we just exchange like, oh, this is my experience of this. Mm-hmm. And it comes up a lot of loyalty stuff with him, like mm-hmm. hugely like putting himself in the place of like, you can send him to test others' loyalties. Uh, I think it is because of that caught in the trap line that like, yeah. There's the deception is there, the manipulation and how to charm others and the art of the deal and all of that stuff that Valafar is very good at this way. Of I, I have a mnemonic with his sigil of it being whatever, I think it's Ka, the, the snake that's in the Jungle Book, the animated cartoon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks like he, because it looks like a snake with a giant head with like a weird scarf on. And that's where my memory of his sigil goes. And that's in my, it's that thing you can't trust, but still have to make deals with sometimes. And again, we're back to, to trees and, and crosses and snakes, right? Don, uh, so yeah, I was just looking up Vea, like Donet, Lacrio, Suspendantor, until they are hanged in a snare. All right, so and that's a hunter's trap. Mm-hmm. So the gallows, it's both the gallows and a trap. It's funny, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the notion of he doesn't have as many legions as some other spirits. Ten is certainly not numerous. There's also the memory of, I'm pretty sure Valapar was a 90s experimental dark ambient ritual band as well. I didn't know that. And because I feel like I have merch from somewhere at some point. We don't often talk about the 72. We tend to talk about Grimorium Verum, especially because of the syncretism with Eshus and Bobajira. It's there for the possibility. So it's nice to give some airtime to the 72. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, yeah, siloing off from being like, I only, only talked to these lot is daft, at least from a historical record, because they, most of them turn up elsewhere as well. So to say, oh, I don't do those lot is, it's a bit odd because you probably do, even if they're under a, a different name in your grimoire, the first deputy of, uh, of Astaroth uh, as well. Yep. So again, we have other ways of approaching the same dramatis personae, wearing potential. Again, if you have many heads, you can wear many hats. Yeah, he is. In one list somewhere, an issue. That's oh. like, I can never find that list when I'm looking for it. So it's not something I put into practice or think very much of. But I like when people make things because then I will sit there and justify their cursory, like, I'm just going to line things up. And then you're like, oh, someone's going to spend 20 years of their life trying to figure out why they're thinking into secretism. Um, mm-hmm. Which again, in the, in the ways of themis, in a thematic mm-hmm. Secretism happens through mass cultural exchange and trajectory, the dominant exerting influence upon the, the lesser. And so individual secretisms do not hold as much merit. They have to be entered into the archive and grimoire. This is what, precisely why you'll see some demons come back around so many times in different forms, because there's, you want more resources to learn about your craft and to learn about these spirits. And it's like, oh, this one has a similarities to this other one. Let me just combine them because they're probably the same thing. And they're going to go under whatever dominant force of your name that you, is it in the system that you, my original system I learned, it was known as this name. So now everything's being realigned to that. Or is it, I like the way this looks better in my handwriting. Do I do these fancy sigils where the crosses 
are extremely weighted, like as if you're using a, a pen quill? Or is it the more modern way where they're not given any weight at all and almost look like weird computerized angelic script on, of an Ascension manual? But it, all these things are so... Is How do I know that I've drawn the, the phallus of Fanuel like the correct length? And mm-hmm. like, you don't want to make that angel have a small dick. I mean, you just... You, it, it, like, when is it going to work? Yeah, dude. Or are we Greek and he needs like the size of the dick doesn't matter and it's the balls all day long. I'm sure I'll catch somebody's comments for that. If now you're just going off of art history here. And this is what we started talking about, I think, just before we press record is this, this sense of like, how do we incorporate old grimoric material that is new to us in, in, in our practice? How do we, and again, uh, for, for, for me, with, with divination and with developing working, hopefully stable working relationships with these spirits. It's, it can be a case of like, hey, I found this older seal for you. Is this like finding your old address and you moved offices and so it's no, there's no point using that thing anymore? Or if I use it as someone else moved into it now? Or does this give you, like you used to do this other stuff, like that, that was your first album when you were a lot prog and now you're a lot more, I don't know, jazz. Like, am I going to get diff- like same spirit, but like with slightly different modalities and and expressions? So I think about that with like which sigils are you using? Some spirits of of, of Verum have, have just categorically said, "Oh, good, finally you're using that one." I'm much I I prefer that one. All right, and again, if you can, if you have solid working relationships and you're able to test contact and, and communion and information suitably with, with divination, then you are. Then it's again we're back to if you can call the spirits uh, th- and they turn up then who's to say otherwise yeah sure. i think there's also a thing there's also a thing here about like is it the same spirit or is it i've been thinking about this thing around like when we call Legions. Legions. when we call spirits versus when we program the airs so that spirit can turn up more easily slash wants to turn up because they like that thing right if we're doing our our love work our love healing our hearts with, with heart scenes and we are burning it to bring forth spirits that like healing hearts, we are putting up a we're putting up a, a wanted ad to an extent. We we we're, as well as programming the airs, as well as making it easier for heart healing spirits to turn up and harder for not those kinds of spirits to turn up. So, well, so in a sense, would that people put the things that show up through the same discriminatory discriminations in a good way interview process that we would put up for someone that showed up for a wanted ad? Because there's that other side of it of like something answered, so it must have gone well. Um, mm-hmm. Sure, sure. We'll find out the price later. Um, uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, sometimes it's good to be a little Calvinist. Be like, are you that that thing, or are you again? Are you, are you three demons in a Helen of Troy suit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that reminded me of it, but the the notion too. I think it's um, waiting for Godot, where they're arguing about Saint Dismas, and they're trying to prove whether or not he he ended up saint or because the Three out of four Gospels, all of them mention both thieves, but only one mentions him going anywhere different than the other thieves. So only Luke, who is the only time we hear of the virgin birth, the only time we hear of a few other things too, who was going to Greeks at that. He was, Luke was proselytizing to Greeks and therefore said, you don't have to be circumcised amongst other things. Like, we're not going to, don't worry, it's going to be okay. You can be Christian too. But that in waiting for good deal, they're like, eh, why go against the majority? which is a nice them- them- thematic thematic thing of like mm, three out of four evangelists say that he didn't mention him going anywhere special. Let's just go with that. Okay, so we talked about how the word might shift to another word and therefore bring in a wider context. These are anatomizations of offices and of effects and of uh, ritual gesture and event and precedent and things like that. And, 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 in, and, and especially in terms of juicing the words out of us, uh, I, I want to talk about Pimpernel next. I wanted to, to start by saying like, the, you know, I'm going to probably not say the thing that is sometimes called Pimpernel, even though I want to use that term, that big one, all one word thing. Uh, Cause there are a bunch of things called Pimpernel, uh, skull caps called blue Pimpernel. Sometimes there's a saxifrage, burn it, which gets called Italian Pimpernel or some, or, which itself is sometimes shortened to Pimpernel. One, of them, of the Anagallises, Alleganus abensis, is itself also called red chickweed, which we shouldn't, which I shouldn't confuse with at least five other, I think, completely different plants, which are also called a kind of chickweed. And water pimpernel is also called orocline uh, as yeah, well. Right, because chickweed is a weed that chickens eat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, <laughs> what does it do? What do people, what, what does nature do with it? Yeah. 
Not all people with the last name Smith are related to each other. Hmm. Not all gay people know each other. Not so all... I think we can talk, we, we, we can definitely talk about like, again, the, the, like ascribing to the plant called Pimpernel, right? I think that's okay to do for the time being, especially if we're going back to Hellenistic conceptions, which uh, are around like Anagallis, like looking at this Latin part of it as well, uh, is from the Greek for, for laughter, apparently. And it does seem that Pimpernel, the, the, the plants that get called Pimpernel are used, or well, some of them at least are used for offering good humid cure by contrary against saturnine melancholy to restore equilibrium, the equilibrium that underlies good health. And you, tinctures of Pimpernel have been used for problems of the nervous system, like epilepsy, as well as a, a variety of other impairments of mental faculties. And I think there's a bunch of uses of it grammatically that we can get to in a bit that all seem to have this quality of helping us uh, calm the storms both without and within. But maybe it's best to start out with a little bit more like actual kind of of botany and things. I've, I've worked a little bit with Paul Men's Weather Glass, uh, which is one of the names for some kinds of, you know, um, because it's, it's, it, it has wonderful behavior where its flowers open to the door and draw closed in the afternoon. So it gets called uh, the shepherd's hourglass. Uh, so this element of that it tells time. And then the plant sensitivity to humidity also causes similar closing actions as a portent of rain. So it's, it, 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 it can, quote, tell the future. Like it is aware of like, here are the patterns. Here is the humidity. Here's what's about to, here's what's most likely about to happen. And so it's also called poor man's weather glass. It warns us of, of coming rains. And I like this idea that, uh, what's that quote about, like, wisdom is knowing when to duck, right? Yeah. Uh, and as such, like, I think it's a great herb ally in terms of, here's what's, here's what's coming. Here's the weather report, not just for what it's like, like we were saying last time, like, what's the weather like? Look outside. But what's the weather going to be like? Go ask the poor man's weather glass. Yeah, I think there's a lot of folk use that comes tied into that. I Pimpernel, as far as, I mean, it's obviously many things. Many plants can be called Pimpernel, as you said, and Scarlet Pimpernel being such a, the, the name that gets associated with the Pimpernel. Mm. The, the primary things that come to mind for me with Pimpernel are the passage of the Knife of the White Hilt. It made the day and hour of Mercury with Mars inside of the Ram of the Scorpion, dipped in the blood of a Gosling and the juice of a Pimpernel. And that itself, like you could, one of the things that in the books that were published in the 60s and 70s, primarily, it was that was a huge promotion of what were called blinds, right? That, oh, it's alluding to things, especially when like some of the other weapons of the Solomonic art call for the blood of a black cat or things like this to be added. And certainly the bowling or the white knife and, and as it bowling as it became, came to be known in, in Wicca and, and other circles as well. First gets mentioned, I think, in Barnalasi's uh, Bagna Rabinica, which is according to notes. Thank you, cheating. Um, it's uh, <laughs> where the Malachan alphabet comes from. And uh, so I, there's some interesting things there. That were just like, why this knife that then, in at least in modern neo-paganism, is the knife that actually does physical labor within the, the service. Yes. And I just saw an interesting discussion of this online. I think it was asked uh, by Matt Orion. It was an interesting discussion. He was asking how about what happens if the black handled knife touches blood or can you use that type of thing? It was like the lore of so much that I had grown up with in the eighties and nineties was like, if any of your knives ever touch blood, human blood, it has to be gotten rid of because it will always come back for more. And that mm -hmm. the black knife can never have touched blood, except that Chumley, when he published Kutub in the nineties, was the one that kind of latter said that Athame came from Athame, which was blood letter and liked it to the dual Karnini, this sorceress suffix sect. And mm -hmm. so there's this, flow back and forth and the arguments of one of the significant markers of traditional witches in the 90s was that they had one knife and used it for everything. Whereas the, the idea of using a knife that only cut through the worlds and was double-sided, which it isn't in the, the Solomonic weapons, right. but it's that it's double-sided within Wicca to cut through the worlds and therefore not through any physical substance. And the, the white-handled knife did everything else that you would want a knife to do. And uh, I don't know, there's all that is tied up into Pimpernel for me. Uh, and uh, in addition to Pimpernel has, if it has red flowers, means that it obviously was there at the crucifixion because everything with red flowers grew at the feet of the cross in like yeah. folklore, which mm -hmm. is just one of those backwards justifications. It's like it opened up because it was it's the of the dawn of Jesus and all these things. It was early morning when Jesus was crucified and then it starts closing. And then it's as it's closing, the drops of blood fall into it. And it turns permanently red. And all its gen, it's all its history. All, all, its, all the Pimpernel's children have to be red in, in memory of this as well. Uh, it's progeny, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that there is, that the, it does have 
this bittersweet thing that if it was present of the crucifixion, it would normally be crying, but Pimpernel itself is laughter. It's Isaac, right? It ties to the prophet Isaac because of that. But then it also remedies melancholy. And so there's something about like the death of Christ promoting through the Pimpernel, this like, if we take it to an Arma Christi level of like, it promotes joy that the son of God died for our sins, which is also some heavy shit. And I like, yeah, yeah. and like, why Mercury? Like, okay, the plant opens and closes. So like, that's mercurial all the time. And also I like that it, it disappears. If the flower is only colored on its upper petals, that when it closes, as the day goes on, that it hides amongst the green again. So it's there and it's not, it's hiding like a thief. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it, 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 it has this beautiful gift that it only shares at certain times. So I, it's easier to see why mercurial with this plant than perhaps some others. I just don't know why necessarily the white hilted knife has to be mercurial. I think it's about industry. I think one of the pre-modern pieces of planetary interpretation that's been sidelined by, and, and don't get me wrong, I love Mercury as like troll and like all the uh, amalgams of the take of Odin and in, in, in the wicked and the divine, like, like the electric circuit boards of connection and, and communication and things like that. But there is this, older idea of Mercury as the industrious craftsperson. And I think the Grimoric text seems to start there. So yeah, there, there are two examples and three pieces of information that we, we should be very grateful for Joseph H. Peterson for sharing. The first is that on the whole, all the earlier Latin texts don't actually say Pimpinella, they read Pimpinella, which is a totally different plant. Also on top of that, a bunch of things use the French word uh, Pimpinel, which is neither apparently Pimpinella or uh, Pimpinel, but rather burn it, one of the Alan Saxon Frenchers. We have two examples of it turning up particularly in the, uh, at least uh, two examples, a bunch more, but like here are the, the ones to go to. So when the knife is specifically said to be like, here's this tool that has its own entry, we can look at, say, the Key of Solomon that we find in Additional Manuscript 36674, which is, you know, a fade for me because it also includes the excellent book and its visions. And this says, besides the, the other knife, you must make, Another knife in the day and hour of Mercury, tempered with the juice of Pimpernel, as you said, with the blood of a goose, upon which you shall cause three masses to be said. Also, you must perfume it and sprinkle it with water, as aforesaid, uh, and which, with which knife all things necessary must be cut. So we have that, that, that set at that point. But the earlier examples, one of the earliest keys that we have, Sloan 3847, which is supposedly dated to the 8th of April, 1572, which makes it a lot earlier than that. 17th century texts that uh, matters is more reliant on. It's the entry on the pentacle where we get this throwaway about let there be prepared Arthanum Nupatum, which is translated as a, a tempered craft knife. And it's, so the pentacle is meant to be made in a Mercury day on the hour of the moon rising with some other, in the sign, in, in, an, in an airy sign or an earthy sign. And there's a bunch of instructions for that which we go into, but you are, you're making these pentacles and when it's giving you like, the instructions of, of, of how to do it, have them a great earthen pot and full of coals and let there be lignum aloes conjured and let the conjurer be clean as it is meat and have their prepared uh, a craft knife tempered in the juice of pimpernel and the blood of a goose made and completed on Mercury's day in the augmenting of the moon, whereupon let three masses uh, be sung with gospels and fumigate. That's interesting, it's sung uh, to me, with fumigations of the knife that you, that you must cut and, make, and cut hyssop with your whole mind and humble devotion, saying these psalms with this oration following so it's a craft knife. like i think i think that's a good uh description of like it is the knife you use to actually be industrious to actually make things mercury as craftsman is an interesting part of this here and that's where i come at the moment in terms of like but again that doesn't there's, there's no no mention of what color it is at this point no but it is interesting I, more importantly the, the even in the the conflation between all these things and people filling in the lines of the, the white hills of knife is the utilitarian knife and here you're talking about the thing that cuts everything else it's also for all the necessary things to be cut, is what it says. It's going to be multiple things. I, I also like just the flash of like, oh, I can justify burn it because like, <laughs> at least it's a salad herb and you can chop it anyway. But uh, <laughs> it's programming it because that is one of the things that's the hallmark of, it, it's borrowed from masonry in my opinion, but the Masonic allegories and emblems that is this in Wicca as well, as far as like, and it, some traditional crafts that are more exposed to Wicca of like, here is the tool. This is what it does. Now use it immediately to remind yourself what it like to, to like that type of, mm. I'm going to give you one 
description of what it symbolizes, and then you're going to use it. Now pick it up in your hand and do something with it. I, I wonder with the Mercury with like, I thought about like, okay, the calling side of things, communication, but you're not calling with the craft knife. You're not calling with the thing that cuts. There is the side of it of, you made me wonder of like, oh, I had a good thought, but then I'm old and I forgot it. So <laughs> uh, it's I mean, I, you know, if nothing else, like a couple years of, of mostly not seeing people as much as, as yeah, is, is shifting a bunch of things. The great speaking. Evening. Speaking of which, one of the main reasons that I got interested in looking at Pimpernel and working with Paul Rance Weatherglass a number of years ago was off the back of my Veron work, which, and, and the, by the time we get Jake's true grimoire, the knife that's used to make the circle is meant to be made or bought on the day and hour of Jupiter with the moon crescent, and you're meant to quench it in mole's blood and the juice of Pimpernel. And the reason I raised this is not just because Pimpernel, uh, but because Mole's bloods and Pimpernel, if we compare them both, the, the vesica that's produced by their Venn diagram of those two overlapping sets of materia are similar in terms of the full of blemishes, the removal of warts, the treatment for mental well-being, specifically like epilepsy stuff, and then a bunch of weather magic utilities, uh, a bunch of like calming storms. So you can see the storm coming and you can protect, and, and the mole's blood has a long record of being used to calm storms. So again, it's Jupiterian at this point. And it's again, back to being used as a circling knife. But f- for me, what's interesting here is, is, is twofold. We can talk about what circling is and the difference between a black handled knife and then you would want it to be made out of steel that's killed someone. And when you wouldn't, it seems to me that the circling knife in Verum is, is more of uh, about creating a, a sanguine environment where you can, where you aren't starting from the point of, of, of threatening while also being able to back up yourself. Should it go that, down that way? But also that again, it seems that there's a sense I like to read in the preparation of these tools, a sense of like, what is this doing for me? Just like if, if you want statue money, if you want statue spirit, then bring me some statue money. If you want me to do this and to do it stably and, and efficiently, at least talking to myself with all these spirits, then what are the ways in which I am I can benefit from using these things to stabilize my practice? And I think the more blood and the Pimpernel, even if that wasn't the original intention of the 17th century Grimmerists who are doing this stuff. For me, I'm I'm interested in what can, how can I use these to do it, but not just do it, but do it better for myself. So I hope that's not like overly like saying that's all it's for. It's just a psychological thing about being sure that you are in a relatively calm state. But there does seem to be a lot of calming, sanguine influence on on the winds outside and the winds within. Um, epilepsy is along with being sometimes called one of the many divine sicknesses. It's also referred to as. Uh, there's also translations of it. It's like mind storms or brain storms or like an internal like meteorology as an analogy or as a microcosm, macrocosm thing. So that's, again, interesting. Where is Mercury uh, and Jupiter relating in terms of not just communication and, and, and expansion, but uh, yeah, weather and its shifting patterns and its effect on us and how Mercury is good with the good and bad with the bad. And so if this quality of being, being changeable as well as understanding good governorship and, and arguably like good just relations. Two things. I remember that it was language of flowers. Pimpernel is a change. So that's interesting as far as a mercurial thing. If you're crafting with it, you are, you're very much changing the object and can be harnessing it to your use. Two things. I think the you're interested in the sun masses, right? Like why that differentiation? I just wanted to get, yeah. I have my ideas on that, but what is, why sun mass being important there? Oh, I, again, when we look at the older record of, of what would become the Grimorium Verum, the, the Caligula Salamos, the Secretus, it, it, it seems that some of the, the barbarous names, words, focus magicae, litanies of spirit names that are used to call forth particular spirits, it's JHP suggests that they, that the translation should be sung, not just said or recited. Uh, and so I'm, I'm interested in where these spirits are moved by, by breath and song. Okay. Like prayer. I will tell you my, my, my Catholic side of that. So there's low mass, there's sung mass, and there's solemn mass. There's other things there. But low mass is a two candle mass. That can be said at any time. Sung mass, the parts that are sung in a mass must be sung. It may or may not include the use of incense. It usually does, and therefore it's almost a differential from a solemn mass, but solemn mass is the most formal. But one of the things that happens between a low mass, which is the common everyday thing, for most, if when you do mass multiple times a day, and there's usually one mass a day that is sung. During a sung mass, the entire congregation is a spurge before it starts. And so if you have objects, 
And even though it's called a mass, you can hold it up and it will get blessed by holy water that is from a person of apostolic lineage. So that is on the Catholic magic side, something that if something says sung mass, it means they're saying, go get it put in holy water. And when it says over it, like, what does that mean? The whole mass is sent over the whole for the whole congregation. So if something is brought in, but if you're able, you're never supposed to have weapons in church, which is the whole reason for the sign of peace, right? You're checking for weapons. The arm of Christi are the only weapons in the, of the church. However, if you were going to sneak it in, that a sung mass has the bucket goes around and everybody's hit with holy water. So there's something to that, I think. It also puts you in a state of, it, it bumps you up on the grace hierarchy. So that if you're not in a state of grace, being a spurge then puts you in a little bit higher state of grace than you were. So if you've been fasting and you've been obeying all the things and you're about to do all this endeavors and you go to a sung mass, not only do you have the benefit of mass and communion, but you have the benefit of being splashed, which brings mm-hmm. us to that point that was we were talking about the other week of the poor priest that decided that he was going to quit being a priest because he had said one word wrong and says we instead of I in the baptism mm-hmm. people. And it started this whole debate. And then many priests were like, I've been saying we as well. And that the discussion of like, the point is that it is a ritual that is, has to be followed to the T because then anybody in an emergency has the ability to call upon that ritual format. Whereas if it's the power vested to the priest, then baptism is not afforded to babies that are born immediately and like are about to die and, and midwives would baptize them through traditional Catholic ability that you could, it's called, you know, bush baptism. But they, this idea, it sparked a whole bunch of interesting debate. Yeah, because is it, is it, is it, is it, again, we're back to, is it a typo? But it, even if it started as such or as a, as a miscopy, it, it, it articulates a, a, a different cosmology, if not a different mechanism of ritual action. Yeah. Right? The, who, who's the we, who's the I, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. When does it matter what we say in ritual? Yeah. Uh, in, well, I, yeah. I thought the, the breakdown too of it was to say that it is because that priest is a sanctioned, it is the priest is representing God at that point. The congregation is not the one that baptizes, or there would be no reason for the priest. And so it, it, it both barks at the authority of the church and also takes away the ability for someone else who in an emergency must channel the spirit and give someone a baptism. Because even under bush baptism, you would still, which is, sounds horribly like racist now that it's, I have no idea. It's just, it was, I, I have no idea, but that's what it's, it's a wild baptism in Spanish. Yeah, yeah, it's like a very strange what thing, but anyway, wait for those people who were baptized outside of the church by someone, especially a midwife or something, you were then taken to the church at the earliest convenience for baptism as well. So it was fairly common practice for I like I know in, in New Mexico for midwives to baptize the babies as immediately as they came out. In the off chance they didn't even survive to get because then baptism, if the bad baby's healthy, you would call a priest right away for last rites and baptism, both because you can't receive last rites without baptism. But that you could also plan your church visit and like make it a big thing and invite family so that we don't know when the baby's going to be born. We can say, no, in, in two weeks, we're baptizing our daughter. Please come. So as long as she had the, the first dose, the first inoculation against the devil in this world, then she would survive until her booster shot officially came from a priest in a church. Which if you've never seen those videos of like priests, it, usually Orthodox priests, like dunking the baby and like slinging it around. That's its own. That's impressive too. The baby is the Asper Jones. Yes, absolutely. Oh God. Yeah. But now, yeah, now I'm hung up on this. Uh, the sung thing is, is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Now I go back and look for like other times because I just realized that when you said that of like, if I tell someone they got to go to a sung mass, it's because one, it's often in Latin. And that's just nicer. Like the, the person who built a poor tradition and loves it. But like, you can get some free holy water splashing. Also that the, there are three sung masses is also means it's duration, right? It's not yeah. just collecting one after the other. Like you, you need to do it again and again. It's like it's over a period of time. It's not just a, a, a one and done. Yeah. There, you have a Golgothite blessing, right? You've got a, it's at least three days worth. Oftentimes, I'm just having done residencies and that long periods at abbeys, like this is, you're going to have a, a, a sun mass in the morning and a mass in the evening, but like they're not always sung. Only one a day at most. And certain feast days are its own thing, but. They're longer for sure. That when you talk about durational, because the sung mass is going to have the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Santos, the Credo, the Agnus Dei sung by the congregation as well. In addition to, if you're in a monastic environment, the psalmody of the day, which could be very short, could be 15 minutes, or it could be an extra hour. And that means that's all that time that you're away from your work, which is the, the, the monastic community might understand they, because they know their cycle. 
But like, if you're like, oh, I'm going on a retreat to write my book and I'm going to participate in such and such comment or Abby's life. And you're like, oh God, there's another hour out of my day. You're like, okay, this is all grist for the mill. This is all medicine. This is all, may the pimpernel open for me and may the blood of Christ transform me through the language of flowers into someone that is a lot more patient than I early am. Uh, <laughs> but, or else let the armor Christi come and stab me in the heart. All right. So the only thing I can think of with Pimpernel is that it's used in rain magic, right? anti warts I think there's also the, the fact that it has, it's high in saponins. So it's so beat. It's not as strong as, say, soap wart, but pretty good there. What does it do? Yeah. There is the, uh, the lining up with the hourglass or the, the weather glass that it is linked to the angelus and is sometimes a, a flower that represents the angelus, which as the angelus as a prayer, which is said before mass and like when the people start reading, it's the preparations for mass. But because it, its closing was pretty on time with certain church bells in certain areas, it got known for being connected to the start of the prayers that start going right before mass. So the, the rosaries that were said. So it, it predicts the heralding of mass itself. Which it's, yeah. It's the, the signpost on the road telling you where you head. Yeah. How about the turquoise? This is the one I suggested. So I mean, like, do you have immediate associations with turquoise? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I use it for Aquistio business and, and for, for Jupiterian stuff in general when I can. And, it, and when, I can't, when I can't get slash uh, afford it. Uh, and again, this is this thing about like, am I spending all my money doing bad money magic? Like, <laughs> 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 I'll also, I'll be straight up, I'll use halite that is turquoise color as well. And here we're back to like, color is also, is also a virtue or a potential virtue or a way of, a way of directing, cohering and deploying virtue. I'm um, looking at you, pyrite. <laughs> I like how it looks against, but it seems to get on well with lapis, which is one of the other ones I use for acquisitio. I know I'll occasionally use turquoise for Laetitia stuff, but I prefer appetite it has more of a revitalizing quality for me. Yeah. But lots of, yeah. So like, Sorting out which blues I use for which things, which is also interesting that like, so turquoise itself is like that, which is from Turkey, right? In, in various different trends, all from Turkic parts, right? Yeah. And then we have the only other historical business I found about it was Pliny talking, calling it Calais, uh, C-A-L-A-I-S. And he says it's like sapphires in color, only that it's paler and more closely resembles the tint of the water near the seashore in appearance. So we have this kind of, wateriness to it. So you know, the deer in America, we call it, we say Calais, like the city in Maine. Huh. Uh, but yeah, Calais. <sighs> I find primary planet then for you would be Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also like looking at the, the ways in which a lot of, you know, the modern gem lore and, and Lepidaries and kind of crystal Bibles talk about it, having an emphasis on purification, on healing even, and on inner peace. And whether that's expressed as like helping you deal with emotional turmoil, which you get back to that stuff. Or just in general, a sense of serenity or tranquility or peacefulness, which again, you know, can, can very much be the better sides of, of good Jupiterian avuncular, avuncularity. It is the 11th anniversary stone. Ah. Which is just 11th, a master number. So it's like, okay, mm-hmm. it's going to stand out in my head. It's probably the only reason I remember it. It is often ascribed to Venus as well in modern gemology and mm-hmm. Neptune. I mean, totally. Ooh, like, it's outer planets. But Johnny come lately. Unless, uh, Sedna. And I'm all about that. Everything's Sedna. That totally makes, well, said, yeah, said, said is the right thing. Right? It, that, that totally makes sense in terms of like the tint of water near the seashore, right? We're into some very like Botticelli Venus stuff, right? Yeah. I said certainly that if you get into color theory, <laughs> which is a, a thing I adore, that blue and green are commonly the same word in many cultures. It's just water colored or life colored. And that even the names for green will be like uh, scummy pond water. <laughs> um, like Red. it's a spectrum, blue green. And certainly there's sure, a- look at look at look at any river, like for any length of time over or over the course of a year or something. Like you're gonna get a wide variety of pantones. I the thing on an aside, I grew I'm from Southern California, so my ocean is the Pacific. Like that's where I imagine when I think of an ocean in my head, I still think of the Pacific. And the Pacific is blue. It is blue. And it, true to its name, it seems to be like a fairly steady ocean with some like, wait, yeah, the first time, <laughs> not in New York Harbor, because I knew that was going to be a different color, but I remember driving out to the end of Long Island, like freshman year at NYU. My friends were like, oh, we're going to go see it. It was like, so this is like full on Atlanta. They're like, yep, that's like 
if you go in a straight line following the the geographies of the maps, you will hit Europe at some point. I was like, this is brown. This water is brown and angry. And they're like, why? But this, I was like, but you know, like little kids, we draw the ocean blue. <laughs> they're like, yeah, the Atlantic's not blue. And I was like, what happened? Why is it? What is it? Why does it look like this? I don't understand. So water color is deceptive in, in and of itself. I, it's interesting because coming from Mexican folklore with turquoise, turquoise is an extremely sacred stone. It's second only to jade. And in many parlances, it's the same word, especially in the north of Mexico, the northern parts of the Aztec Empire, where they're using uh, the word for, for precious stone. Jade covers both. It covers any greenish blue stone. And greenish blue being the color of life itself, which then has a, a particular resonance for both water and fire. And that the, the light and darkness, the, the life and death, these polarities that come out, which is heavily tied into indigenous cosmologies of like non-oppositional dualisms. They, that fire and water are not opposites in a war, but the tension between them is because of the distance between the ends of the particular sets that you're looking at. But they are in essence the same things that opposites must be tied to themselves. And there is non-oppositional. This is an interesting side of doing things. But digression-wise, turquoise is also associated with heavily the, the, the word for fire and the word for year. So it has to do with time and the flow of time. It has to do with Shiyate Kutki, who is the, the younger aspect of the, the grandfather fire figure. So Shiyate Kutki is the, the younger warrior aspect that is tied to the life-giving essence that is blood. So therefore, the flint blade is sacred to him. And what, like as far as day science, he's tied to both the flint blade and to water. But water there signifies the fact that it's, it's blood, that water is jade colored, not in its physical color, but in its preciousness. That, and therefore, this water that is also fire, because it is warmth. Because if you're talking about fire as giver of life is warm by its nature. So even though in water, as when we're talking about it as something positive, would be viewed as something hot, metaphorically, because it is a giver of life. We Are we alive because we're hot or are we hot because we're alive? Question comes into play. So there's a little right, bit right. of humoral, humoral theory starts. When you explain it, it's, it's vocabulary and nomenclature is slightly different than the European. But when you explain like what's going on there, it's very easy to shift and go, okay, I get what you're going for there of like, how it's both water and fire, how blood and water must be. They did if she had to quit his wife, uh, touch with the quake, which means precious jade serpent skirt, precious jade skirt, a serpent skirt is the other Sorry. That the water flowing from her is tied to the amniotic fluid. It's tied to any sweet water that comes out, which is there's a difference between that and, and the rain waters that are Claude Lope's department at the realms of the dead. But just this concept of turquoise that, that she had to be as a fire lord lives in a turquoise palace. That is, and it is the turquoise is not just up because of its color, but because it represents the beauty of life, that he is a life-giving fire and any, he is also the Lord of the directions in that way, that there's center pot in the house where an eternal fire is kept, is under his domain. And so his name literally means turquoise Lord, but turquoise here has a whole metaphoric quality that not unlike how we would say it's the golden child. We don't expect that child to be covered out in gold when we meet them on the street. Although if you were representing them in art, you might put them in gold where everybody else doesn't, or a halo or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's so mm -hmm. interesting when we're struck with a different worldview that it, it seems odd at first when we don't consider our own metaphors and, and metonyms coming into play that, that shape a worldview as to why it's a worldview because we don't question it. So I, turquoise's complexity for being both fire and water symbolic of time and right attitude towards orientation in the cosmos is fascinating to me. So I, I think the beneficence of it is there hugely. And then that makes me think about with the, some people ascribing it to Venus and you and many other people ascribing it to Jupiter as well, that we, those are the benefics. And so there is something interesting in this stone of it being benefic by nature, that there is a flow, that there is uh, a purity that comes in there, an orientation to the universe. And I, if, you, if anybody is interested, there's a lot of weird literature on, not weird, there's a lot of literature out there, studies, because for whatever reason, the Spanish said that turquoise wasn't mined in Mexico. And there's been consistent turquoise mining in Mexico since the early 400, 500s, like common era. Like it's it as a thing for art, it was valued because to show something that was precious, a deity might normally wear red and black. She typically wears red and black paint, but 
in the masks that were there. They would be covered, they would be painted red and black. And they'd be covered in turquoise. You didn't know what paint was underneath it, but it was to show that it was precious. So turquoise is the stand-in for jade and jadeite, which a lot of those supplies had already run out. But the jadeite is a harder stone, Mesoamerican jade. There's a lot in Canada coming out now. But I find the, the turquoise stuff fast. fast. There it is. There it is. It's about- <laughs> um, <laughs> and, no, it, it is fascinating, it's especially finding that like sense of where elements aren't necessarily, like, like fire and water aren't necessarily opposing each other, that there's a sense that this thing is expressing an interactionality or even, like you say, a flow between things. And certainly like Jupiterian, sang- uh, Jupiterian Venusian referring to the hot waters that flow and give life is, is all very like sanguine mysteries, right? I like the etymology of it, like just the shihuich is, is jade and then teo shihuich means God's jade or divine jade, which is like jade, or excuse me, this is turquoise. Shihuich is turquoise and te, te, uh, teo shihuich is God's turquoise. And it, it, impl- it could, you could use jade, it could be describing jade, but it's describing like turquoise of an exceptional quality. And this implies just because when you, when jade is mentioned, chad shihuich, it, it becomes a, a marker of preciousness of rarity. And similarly, Shihuik is something that just, it, it warms you. Like it, it brings life back into you. It brings life back into the body. So I think, and then if you consider that the, the Mexica, the Aztecs, their closest relatives with the Hopi, and if you go up into the Southwest of the United States, closest style linguistic relatives, we know that they're from that area originally. A lot of the jewelry that is used now relies on turquoise and silver. Um, and turquoise being just this incredibly precious the lapis of the Americas, because lapis is almost always Afghani, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but turquoise, turquoise, it's just, it's a very comforting stone for me. Do you think there's a fair comparison then to like good as gold and things like that in, 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 in English and things that there's a sense that, like you're saying, like the golden child, the turquoise child as, is not As far as colors go and things, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, different cultures are different microcultures within, we, we all know when, when someone's blue, or someone's green, what that means, like a person who, and we know the differentiations, like you can be green with envy, to have green eyes, to their eyes or their glance turn green in the tree, we know they're talking about envy, versus like when someone's green themselves, they're new to something, which is implying plants, but those different color meanings don't always carry across, they certainly aren't universal even in in Europe, but the, the polarities of white and black or red and black are these different things that decide out and I don't know. There's something to that with not only the Mesoamerican color palette there and because gold was used, but this is the eternal argument, right? This is why the Spanish were so excited and like, you use gold, where is it? And they're like, we don't hoard it. We just use it on religious shit. Makes it shiny. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, very yeah. sweet as, as we talked about last time. Yeah. I also think there's a thing here, if I'm not interrupting like something of like the... <sighs> Not just like, oh, did you know the planets also had different colors? But when we start to talk about the life of the planets, the, 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 the breath of the planets, the spirit of the planets, the spirits of the planets, we also come across a lot more color variation. Like even, even within like the, the, the ruling spirit of Jupiter, Hismael, the, the uniform given by John Hayden and many others is literally sea green or blue. So for a start, we've got like, oh yeah, fine. Absolutely fine. Purple which we've also talked a little bit about, ash color, which I find fascinating, and mixed yellow and green. So like there's the planet, which you might decide makes sense to be mostly one color or maybe like shades of that color. But then the spirits themselves are going to come forth with different expressions of those things. Yeah. And what happens if any grimoire writer who's like getting actual divine information and channeling these things is colorblind? Mm-hmm. But the, even the the scales, right? So the king scale, the queen scale, the, the golden dawn scales, which are based upon the different Kabbalistic worlds, do change the color of the spheres in those ways, and therefore the planetary influences as they come through those spheres, right? Uh, which is, and we can see that in other systems, even where we, you know, with with nuances of Osh, Oshun being yellow, but you know, as Orisha favoring different shades of yellow for different qualities or roads that are manifesting. And even using, you know, that against her that some roads don't like yellow and you can use that to enrage that road. But as the default, yellow is the color and therefore can be used ritually unless until you better you do what is default. Right. And I think about that with like huh, materiality and availability in some material culture. 
So like you remind me that like, so for instance, Orisha Oko, the beads for Orisha Oko are, are pink traditionally, but pink became extremely difficult to get at one point. And there was this kind of grayish lilac lavenderish that was available in the beads mm. in New York. And they started using those as a substitute for so many years because there were no good pink beads that were cheap enough. And so they saved the big, the good pink beads for the ritual beading, but like the everyday beads that came. And then they started turning more towards the grayish lavender. And then as people replaced those, they didn't replace them with the pink, they replaced them with more grayish ones. And so the material culture informed what was available for you to use out of your own culture that you say where if the Cubans are the ones that are doing these patterns, they're basing them upon a mixture of what they find aesthetically pleasing, what's available, and Yoruba color theory and ritual theory that then is now being placed in New York, which is, and they're getting their beads from the Chinese and imports. And so it, that's fascinating too, how the colors and descriptions of these things can change based on availability. And like the fact that turquoise is named for that stone from Turkey, that pretty stone from Turkey, you're like, okay, well... You know, that could be any number of things. And what makes, as you brought up, the color is a, a virtue in and of itself that is often erased by the modern mind because we've mastered color in a different way. But the ability to make fake coral is not only a big market for deception reasons, but also for practical reasons of like, you don't want to wear your good jewelry out all the time, but you want to still feel that you're wearing the coral the same way that if you bit fake plants, still do have a calming effect on people in the dentist's office. Yeah, and again, morphology, color, even if you're going to perfume those synthetic flowers, those are all doing things still. Like I banged on about before, the image, there are the, like there are, there are uh, image magics that seem to use the image of an apple for the same things you would use an actual apple for. Um, yeah. So again, the image of the plant can still have the qualities of the plant, like especially if it, look, it isn't just a flat image, but it's a sculpture of the thing and, and looks like it. Is it, again, is it deception or is it trying to accurately play that role? And making do with what you have. Certainly the whole idea of what an image is to carve a, a righteous man holding the head of his enemy on a small cabochon of a gemstone in a 44 minute period with any artistic styling or accuracy for the stylus, but <laughs> it, it's good enough. You remember the first time I saw one of those like, quote, Gnostic gems? What isn't Gnostic? And being de- actually relieved, like seeing these things, like hearing these like detailed descriptions of like, Annie shall have the head of a chicken and she'll be holding this and this and this and this on a sunny day around noonish. And then realizing that the, these stones, these captions were like less than an inch and being like, how are they doing this? And then looking at some of them at least and being like, oh, thank goodness. It's stick figures. Oh God, thank you. Oh, yeah. okay. And again, we're back to like looking at a lot of the, a lot of the diagrams, a lot of the sigils, a lot of the, the, the circles in, you know, Thesaurus Spiritum and older Brimoires, they do not look neat. They were not done with a compass. They, uh, it's very easy to look at them and be like, that is shulky as hell. Like, what do you, what, like, it, it, did, 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 did the clock just not care? And maybe they did. Maybe the important thing was you got a version of that, that symbol down. And that yeah, I go back and forth on this because there is all sorts of like a- accepted, not just law, but ways of doing things that suggest that the more perfect the circle, the, the more balanced the, the operation can be. But then, like, if you did, it's not like they didn't have round things to draw around necessarily. So maybe that's not an emphasis here. Maybe, you know. Well, yeah, it, I think certainly that, the, the, the debate between uh, written record and, like, I'm not going to draw this perfectly, nor am I going to do the sigil perfectly. And, like, I, if you were my student, I would show you exactly when I make this mark, it should actually be translated into this mark. But you would not know that unless you were my student. So, like, I don't right. want to so make a liver spiritum. I wanted to make a catalog. So there's that side of it. We're back to we're back to the Golden Dawn changing what their inner tarot heraldry was to a, an outer one that was code that then becomes its own layer of meanings. So it's transmission stuff. It's ensuring that that you that hopefully that, that, that you have an eye on people who are doing the the same thing you are. Hopefully it's about the honesty of the and, and the responsibilities of those transmissions. There's yeah. There's also that sense of like there is no practice. There is no practice sigil. There is no, like, if the, like you, you can't practice that invocation if you're saying it's happening either well or badly. And so we you know, change one word or change like that sigil. So it's not the, it's that part of the sigil. So it's not the same thing, but you could practice that. And then just remember when you're actually doing it, it's, it's the other thing. The scratching and things like that reminds me of the uh, whatever season, there's really two seasons of it with Rome on HBO when mm. uh, the woman is cursing. And she has a, it's a beautiful illustration. If you've not seen that scene, that's just fantastic. But she has a lead scroll and she's speaking vile things, but she's just carving 
straight lines crossing on each other. The way that you would look at somebody like, there's a psychopath in the room when you see pen marks going over things or like a face. It's good. But she's just making marks. And I like this idea of like, I can't draw for shit, but I can visualize Jupiter holding the head of my enemy while I make marks and talk about how amazing Jupiter is. The whole thing like, I don't need your, is it your signature or your mark here? Like maybe you don't have a signature, make an X, but it's your X. And the, the impression, the, the astrology, the, the breath of while you're doing this is now anchored to this, this Saturnine thing that can be folded up and then thrown into a pit. And you can take it to the temple to a sung mass of the Saturnine nature while they offer a bull to Saturn and then the blood gets splattered on everything for you. And, and that blood runs through the grooves of that which you have carved. Like, yes, yeah, the, the vital mysteries of it. Yeah, yeah the, the final breath of the animal that is sacrificed animates the, the bones of the thing that you have left for the person. Yeah, it's, there's lots of little things there that are fun. Speaking of weird marks, and uh, I don't know why wrappings is naturally associated with that, but it is for me because mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of things that kind of remind me of the Fox sisters and the things we've talked about. And I, I wanted to, I, we have a long list, not as long as we'd like, but there's a list of like, oh, we should talk about them on an episode sometime. And like, I don't know why, I just felt like sometimes we, we do magicians of the distant past or big we're marheads and things like that. It's like, Fox sisters are pretty fucking influential and like Mm -hmm. also like a very tragic story, whether you believe that the recant, the recanting was real or if Mm -hmm. it even, and if it wasn't real, it's still tragic. Mm -hmm. Like that's, it's this hard thing of spiritism grew out of at least what we call spiritism grew out of the Fox sisters talking to Mr. Splitfoot on March 31st in 1840 something. So this is the, the side of that is this previous to the, the Civil War when they're starting. And spiritism takes off because of the Civil War heavily, like, and, and land s- snowballs. There we go. Which doesn't actually happen when in me. I've tried so many times to be like, how can I start an avalanche with a snowball? But like <laughs> the idea with so many massive amounts of dead that people wanted, the Mary Todd Lincoln inviting people to do seances in the White House of, yeah. of what this means. But that on, on March 31st, there was the girls who were living in Hydesville, New York, which is way, way out towards Rochester on the western side, which is an interesting county. Because, or that whole area of western New York is important because it's where Mormonism starts. That's where the Angel Moroni first gives the golden tablets to Joseph Smith. It's where uh, several forms of Adventism start. It's uh, so millennial cults. The Shakers have a stronghold there and spiritism. So something's in the water of the Great Lakes that is feeding western New York. And then the, the medium spiritual spiritism happened here in Poughkeepsie, actually, in the Hudson Valley. It was like the first person channeling spirits in that way. There was a great podcast that talked about the history of it. But sisters, so 11 and 14, they were living in Hydesville. They were a Methodist family, which is its own, there's own contextualization there. But the house had a, a weird reputation. And the neighbors felt like someone had died in it, <laughs> even before they, the sisters were, but so it, the story of the wrappings was told that they, they heard it in 1848, March 31st. They decided to talk to the noises that were happening in the house and asked it to indicate like that there was some intelligence behind the wrappings by interacting through, through saying, what's my age? Like count out the age and it would do their ages. And the neighbors were invited into the house, according to the records. So it became a neighborhood, a thematic <laughs> uh, <laughs> movement forward. So over the course of the, of the next few days, they called the spirit Mr. Splitfoot, of which is just a, is a name for the devil, and that the the spirit eventually identifies itself as a peddler named Charles Rosna, who had been killed allegedly five years previous and buried in the cellar. So it's interesting that we get both the record from the Fox sisters, but we also get Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame was a famous famously loved spiritism. And he did a, a biography on them as well. He wrote about their lives. So he claimed that the neighbors dug up the cellar that night and found bones. Later on, it's examined, bones are examined and they're saying there's chicken bones and some dust. So it wasn't the box that is the peddler's box and has some bones in it is enshrined in Lilydale, which is <laughs> uh, the spiritist city that's here in New York. Uh, you can visit it in the museum. But the neighbors were convinced that someone had been murdered in the house. 
and they asked the spirits through the girls. The girls were being employed by mediums, which plays upon child searing yes. that we've talked about before, well, specifically in tandem with the, 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 the Fatima visitations. But child seers themselves are this whole class of thing. And so 11 and 14, you're presuming pre-menstrual for at least one of them. And this idea here, that the the because this is one of the arguments of why uh, it would be young boys was because there's no possibility of menstruation, which would be rendered unclean in the magical operations. But here they're still employing young women to to talk to the spirits for them. And this yeah. community ostracized a man of their choice. They went through lists of names until they found a man and, and the whole town then shunned him as the murderer of that person because he lived in the house at one point. So this is already like, you get a weird kind of like Salem witch craze feel that these girls were swept up in something, that there may have been something genuine that all of a sudden was like, we need answers and we need them now. Who killed him? The girls just have to produce something. Like a coin is going to land mostly on heads or tails. It might land on its edge once or twice in like millennia, but like mm-hmm. it, they've got to talk. And so they go to Rochester and it, it keeps building and there's this whole phenomena of developing around it. And they become famous and their public seances in New York attract huge names imitators so other people are starting to do it and of course by the 1850s people are really trying to find out the fraud side of it they're like this can't be real this goes against what we believe so the they investigate the fox sisters people are trying to use science to defraud them other people are using trying to use science to legitimize them you get around that time of like people actually writing about psychomancy for the first like actual published things in, in, in huge distribution because of the phenomena of the Fox sisters. So it, it, feel free to jump in anytime. I just, I... No, yeah, yeah, that's the, that stuff I was reading up on. What's his name? Page, is it? Yeah, Charles yeah. Grafton Page. Yeah, he's a... I find, so he's the guy that investigates and ends up saying like they're probably using some kind of device to make wrapping. Uh, and also ref says like they're doing it under their skirts and has this whole thing about like, uh, is this really like feminine modesty? Or is this like an excuse to deceive us? But what's fascinating for me about Page is that he's a patent designer and, a, and a, a, right, he's a, so he's already intre- so he's a designer and a, a, yeah, patent advocate. So he's super interested in like how would I build that device, right? That, that's the mentality he's coming from. Like how would I do this if I was trying to if I was trying to re- recreate this just with with mechanics and without any spirits? That to me is really interesting. Oh, the feminine security of these rappers against, and again, calling them rappers is amazing. B-boy stance. The feminine security of these rappers against the inspection of their actual bolodo. If by search warrant, stratagem, or vietalmis, uh, the rapping instrument of these fox girls had been exposed to the public, there would not have been one doubt about the nature and origin of the spiritual communications. But the thing is that they set things off. So this is, uh, we're talking 1848 for this first one, right? This first... The, the, but there were already oh, things happening. So you had the, it's Andrew Jackson Davis is the Poughkeepsie seer. So in 1843, he hears lectures on magnetism, which was animal magnetism, which is the precursor of hypnotism. So you have these lectures being given in the 1830s and 40s as the science becomes more and more popular for people to experience like these traveling road shows that were showing basic scientific experiments as freak shows. Or par- as part of freak shows. So you had the mad scientist character and trope being part of the people that were also moving with these different traveling shows. But he, in the 1840s, started doing magnetic healing, and which was even then regarded as a pseudoscience, and starts writing these books. He's influenced heavily by Swedenborg, who's an alternative, one of the, the spiritist founders. But there's also just this idea of all of this evolving in New York because of the heavy Quaker and Shaker presence, that the Shakers themselves went into ecstatic trance by waiting in silence and waiting for the Spirit of God to come into them. So there's already this idea of Quakers waiting in silence until they have to speak up, stand up and say, friends, I'd like to share something with you, and referring to, and like not swearing oaths, for instance, because if you can't take someone at their word every day, then there's no point in saying that. And now I'm telling you the truth for sure. But right, 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 right. Quality that spiritism itself is tied up into early ideals of abolition because you eliminated priesthood. You eliminated everybody else's authority that you were talking to the spirits directly. And the fact that the Fox sisters are credited, even though rightly so or not, because we already know there's other traditions around the world that were even practiced through, through the slave trade and practicing in the Caribbean concurrently, where there's what's called low spiritism going on, where people are channeling and receiving messages from 
dead people, from spirits, from deities, from saints. That this goes back to Oracle of Delphi being possessory, and, and previous to that, like this is nothing new. But this this riding the wave of pseudoscience to describe this and to play into the commercial nature because trains are a thing now and they can get around quickly and we can market the Fox Sisters. Come see the Fox Sisters at the Petty Dreadful. And so I think that's also interesting, too, that the commodification of these gifts becomes no longer just like, oh, my town has people that do that. And we go there where we need a healing to like now we've mixed it up with like American like tent revivals as a goes back. It's practical. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that it's November 1849, where we get the the first, the, the, the uh, Corinthian Hall in Rochester, the first demonstration of spiritism held before a paying public. Yeah. Right. So again, yeah, suddenly there's the money in that. So yeah. yeah. Is there anybody here with a J in their family? <laughs> um, <laughs> does your name begin with a letter? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> calling people to talk to the dead frauds is also nothing new. We, we, we've talked before about the literal <laughs> denigration, blackening of the term Goetia from the, the, the fifth century with Magi coming in to replace it as like the cool new Persian. We're more like we're priests, but we're not, but we're very clever. As a, And Goetes comes to start meaning kind of the equivalent of like TV psychic, right? And that's why Jesus being called one by his, like by, by his detractors is not a sign of his great necromantic power. It's that they're, they're, they're trying to call him, yeah, they're trying to call him a, a grandma botherer. Yeah. So that itself is nothing either. But uh, for me, the yeah, one of the, the the core things, and again, not to say, oh, this is always the same. And this, there's never any like uniqueness, these iterations, is that, that it starts with a, a haunted house, that it starts with needing to investigate unfinished business of the dead. And the doctors that evolve from this, because... I mean, by the time you get it, like Mexico had a spiritualist president that made public policy based on whether or not his spirits told him to go forward with things. I find the personal life of them. And for those of you in New York, you can visit their graves. Two of them are in Cypress Hills. One of them is in Greenwood. It's an interesting, it's an interesting energy. I, I don't want to be that vague, but I'm going to be that vague because there's this, there is the side of it of one of them marries a Wall Street banker after her first husband dies. Margareta marries the Arctic explorer, explorer, and he's convinced that that Leah was doing nefarious things with engaging them to different people. And so, but Cain marries Margareta, and she converts to Roman Catholicism. And when he dies, she goes back to being a medium. Mm. She, so there's already this, and people have argued that oh, it's because she had no more money because like she needed money, and so she was doing these appearances. But she joined her sister Kate, who was in England. So they both went to England. They went and that was, everybody would pay for their trips. So there's people because if I can do, they knew they can make their money back right away by sponsoring them. So all of these sisters have tragic lives. Two of them, I believe, published the expose and say like very adamantly, like we were doing it with our toes. We were, I can show you how I did it. And the other one never says that. The other was like, no, it was, I don't recant. So Margareta and, and Kate, Katie, both make very strong statements Against spiritualism as a movement, saying that it's gone way in a bad way. One of the greatest curses the world has ever known, I believe. One of them says that. Yeah. And she's like the, the founder of it without meaning to found a religion. But that one of them that recanted most heavily on her deathbed also said it wasn't fake. But that was, we were going to be lynched. And like, we needed to find a way we could make more money by decrying spiritism and staying alive. And I'll have to do the research on that. But that's what I remember from the lore on it. Of the, the, it, the, it was an admission that it was actually a trick to stay alive and keep making money. That it, once they started fading about the money, people were crying it out because they didn't like it. Then it became, no, it's fake and I'll show you why. Come show, come here and I'll table wrap for you. And then yeah. went around doing that. This really reminds me of the of John Lomperson's account of the, the Tedworth drummer uh, in 17th century England with, the, with the, 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 the haunted drum. And then the, again, this house that starts doing what was and becomes a media spectacle that all these priests and, and, and lords of the manor and then random people start turning up. And the son of the homeowner who originally reported this stuff told in later years that his father recanted for it and said, no, it wasn't real, it wasn't real. Because he needed everyone to leave the house because they were literally eating him out of house and home. 
yeah, it, 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 the, the the farm couldn't function anymore. Like there, there were just constantly people that he had to feed turning up and, and poking the walls and, and trying to decide whether it was fairies or the devil or a devil or uh, 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 a revenging sorcerer or, or what have you, or any combination, or witches or any combination of those factors. But like, like this idea that just because you say you recant, like because you have to, because otherwise economic necessity yeah. doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. That, that, that perhaps thematic pressure, I'm using this metaphor for way too long, may actually be like a pressing board that you've been pressed to confess to something that you that is not a confession needed. One and analogy. I think the I'm reminded of because I I can see that visiting the graves and things like this, like I've collected grave dirt the first time I went, it was not I was like, nah, I don't feel it. And the second time I was like, yes, okay. And it's mostly about trying to understand and that weird certainty flash back and forth. I know people that have tried to use it in workings and, and oils and things like this. And I don't know. It's a little dubious. It's like there were people that were using like Lovecraft grape dirt for occult things. And I was like, that man hated the occult. I would rather use the things that inspired him for stories, go to the Odessa church in Brooklyn that like where he saw the how, like that's different. But like we have to take into account that like just because it makes me think about other famous figures that we don't know their life stories or how they felt about the things they wrote about or documented. And like, it's that link, it's that Arma Christi, it's that thing of like, it makes the myth more real. So I'm going to use this as a big kilom to the work. But that's not how, for me, that's not how like oils work. Oils are recipes given by spirits that like, we don't necessarily know all the reasons why. So you have to test it out. But mm. it's also there's an intellectual thing of like, oh, no, that's where I put the handkerchief the priest gave me at Lourdes. And it's like, was that dipped in Lourdes water? Did the thing, were you crying? And the priest just like gave you somebody like 500 people snot. Like, like it, it has, but what is, where do we go with that? Yeah. It's fascinating. Cause I mean, it, if it works, why not argue, but mm -hmm. with the Fox sisters specifically, it's just an interesting thing to visit the graves of those types of dead magicians, those ancestors, whether or not a magician in the fullest sense of like juggler and deceiver and these things of the, the fact that the Fox sisters are mentioned in so much pseudoscience and parapsychology without ever mentioning their, their recanting. And then from the medical side, it's always mentioning they're recanting, but not mentioning the fact that for years they were also saying they were doing it legitimately. And that like, there was like, there's people that talk to them in their personal life and say, no, they said that they was real. What they didn't like was that everybody ran with it. And it's a little bit to me, I don't know why, but I'm going to bring up the Gardnerian Alexandria divide of like, when, when you're proposing in the British wink, wink, nudge, nudge type of spectrum of Masonic truth, but not fact. That, that this is the ancient fertility religion that Murray talked about, that when Alexander's claims that he got the Book of Shadows from, I, I don't want the council to come after me, from being third degree initiated by his grandmother in his attic as a young boy, by being kestrel by his grandmother in, in the attic, and that you can claim that the Book of Shadows is the same because it is, I'm buying into your myth, and we can't, the Gardnerians can't contest it because that destroys their cover story as to what it is. Even though we know that there's certain parts were written at certain points throughout history. So it's this thing of like with the girls, it's like how much of it was genuine? How much of it is little kids being naturally in tune with other things that aren't there because they're not told to not pay attention to them? How much of it was girlish? Like, hey, we're getting attention. We're having fun. Like, oh my God, I see something over there. Maybe they did see something. But like right. now they have to give it a name. What's it saying? I was like, I don't know. It just was like, it was like a dove in the corner of the room. No, it has to tell me what it says. Now it tells me it's the demon Malthus and it's coming after y'all. Many different things can be wrong. Many different things can be right at the same time. <laughs> like just because you, yeah, just because you screw up what you think a spirit said doesn't mean that spirit isn't real or that you didn't have a, a, like a, a, an experience. Yeah. I like that you just ended it. Many different things can be wrong. You can st edit it. <laughs> that's, that's one of my, that's one of my comforting things I say to my divination uh, clients. Uh, that's why we need to, to map this and look at many of the moving parts. Yeah, as opposed to just the standard, I could be wrong, but what I see is like, I'm probably wrong. And here's why. <laughs> Again, obviously a divination system provides not just an answer, but a, a, a sense of how certain the answer is, right? I, again, one of the, the, the things I, I, I like about Geomets is that its judges, its courts can be read to say, things are too up in the air to be sure right now, but it looks like if no other factors are present, this would probably be the case. And then there are other times when it's like, no, this is going to happen like this. Yeah. These are the, like when this thing meets, this thing happens. The scale of right. probability or like it, or even in a, a dissecting a natal chart, very much in the traditional astrology way of like, no, there's point systems ascribed. 
And like, you could, there's many ways to find an Elmutant, but here's like, okay, here's 40 questions. You'll find the Elmutant by the time you get to the end of these 40 questions. You may have found it after question eight because like, the same planet keeps coming up. But like, also in looking at the chart, I'm like, you've got no air and no water in your chart. That is going to say something. And when we look at like, how are you going to die? And what are your social lives going to be like? Then we can say the probability went from 30, 70 to like 90, 10, that you are going to die in a violent way or that you are going to marry four times as opposed to twice because of certain things coming up multiple times. So the same figures, which we've talked about at least some episode, just the idea that reify, um, especially in like uh, oracles in, in, in African oracles of like, if something comes multiple times, it's reifying it. Like this is still happening. Now it is more intense. As opposed to, I think you said, sometimes there can be a tendency to be like, now we've got to look at the acquisitio of the acquisitio of the amizio of the acquisitio, which can like a lot of rabbit holes. But sometimes it might just be, there's a fuck ton of acquisitio in this chart. Like there just is. So like, let's start with that. What sign appears the most in this chart? Yeah. And perhaps that is a good place to be like, who cares what the end, the end figure is important. But if the majority of its constituents are composed of the same figure, if, if there's 15 slash 16 places, and seven of them are one figure. I'd want to pay attention to that. Um, yes. And yeah. that does, and the shields at the end, the last three figures don't necessarily betray the additives that went into it in the beginning. So it's fascinating of like, that's where the active art of interpreting, of, of putting the C back in seer comes back in. So Aquistio, again, having been going through old notes and, 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 and waffle and delineations and, and, and notes on notes and things. I have been really just enjoying, again, amassing <laughs> different names for figures, the different things they're called that I have, that it, both of the friends of mine with the language for it have translated out of the, some Arabic sources, some more poetic Latin versions, as well as things that I've heard spirits call them. So I, I yeah, I like the idea of um, just collecting a bunch of different names for Acquisitio, gain, grasping, the picked up, inner wealth, receiving, possession, to take home, leveling up, aimed, seizing the animal, interior comprehension, amassing, encumbrance, incoming, the apprehended, conquest, admonishment, capture, receipt, the admitted, obtaining benefits and passing to a higher grade. And so all of these kinds of themes of like, yes, acquiring, amassing, gaining, as well as the pedagogical elements of that, of gaining knowledge or gaining experience or gaining expertise, along with a bunch of stuff about balancing the, the inner with the outer. Yeah, Acquisitio is, yes, as I said, like I, I like thinking about it, uh, introducing the Jupiterian figures as the mullet of Jupiter. If, yeah, uh, Acquisitio is the business up front to Laetitia's party in the back. Oh, it's a great, uh, it's, it's lovely. It's very business formal. Uh, and I think that's an easier way of framing it than always lawful necessarily. I mean, there's a big element of officiousness, I would say, to certain expressions of acquisitio, but it's also as much about using loopholes. So I wouldn't say it's unlawful, but it's morality to it and a sense of like quiet and just getting on with building empire. There's less of the solary, like, I am here building my empire in my, you know, it's Fortuna Major's like huge golden tank or like bright golden armor and like Throw your, your slings and arrows at me at Regis Fortune. Aquistio is the accountant of the king, quietly just like stacking the coffers to an extent. Has some old money qualities to it as well. It's one of the few delineations in English that refers to ancestors, specifically in the fourth house. The weight of, it uses the word, the weight of expectation of ancestors. The, oh. the, the, the settled dead. It comes up in the fourth a lot of, um, the, the queerance father, is uh, going to give you, is going to give him money, but he's also going to expect him to, if not follow in the family business, then at least do what his father did. And it's the pressure between fathers and sons and, and inheritance in that sense, not in the sense of other money of the dead and the eighth, but like what is settled here? What is the family crypt? How do you keep that going? How do we, what is the rooted trunk of the family tree? What does that want? How is that branch? You are the, you are the, the living branch, but like you also very much pressured from below, so to speak. That's fascinating. I mean, we've talked, it was five years ago when we last talked this figure, I believe, which is <laughs> impressive because we lost half that episode. And we did, the part we did talk about the figure though is, is in the released second half. So might as well state that our plan is to go back and talk about the things we didn't talk about. 
on and re-record that episode at some point just for the sake of completion. However, the story that goes with the corresponding Odu of the, the, the traveler who traps troubles in, in pots and sets up camp in a town and is going out and capturing the evils of the world and befriends a little girl who he tells, do not go in that room, do not take the thing, the sheets off. And of course she does and I believe she dies because he gets run out of town. And so she lets the evils back in the world. And as you pointed out in the Bridget episode, there's no hope. Yes, that's the, the change in the Pandora story. It's a little girl who's curious, who is befriending an older dude, who's wandering around and is trying to do good, but is now blamed for putting all these things in the world as opposed to trying to fight. So there's a little bit there of this, this Odu has that side of it. There's also the the part where I think we've talked about this when we're talking about Via and Ogbe of Ofu, which it's daylight, so it's about, is in heaven as the ruler. And is everybody, it's, it's socialism. Everybody's got everything they need. Each man according to their merits, each man according to their needs type of thing. And it's boring as hell for the rest of the Odu and the entire populace of heaven. And they don't like this. And they think that there's a way that if they create a form of imbalance, that they'd be able to live easier. Like they, the people they don't like, like those are the people that should work harder. And so they conspire and they set up a rigged contest between Ogbe, who would be like Zia, and Ofu, who is like Aquisitio and they rig the contest and, and Obe becomes the new ruler. And so in the lineup of figures in this world, when they all came down, Via is at the head and Ofun, who is the, the primary, the prima materia of all of them, is now relegated to the last place, even though they're not the youngest. So Amicio Oshe, which is the opposite of this figure, become, is the youngest by nature and he goes all the way to the end and follows it up. So there's, as he's leaving the kingdom, disgracefully he says you you want money so you want this inequality so bad i'll give you something to market and he gives them cowrie shells which are money so he's marking the inequality through money and it is the phrase that goes with that is where the curse is born and the curse is literally money money is then must be fought for um and fought over and this marker inequality will burn humans from until they die until the race is until all humanity is gone we will not figure out how to live together peaceably that we've had it in the past even and we could not make it work. So it's one of those things that, okay, then how, where do you go from there? So this sign can give tremendous wealth. This sign can mark being replaced. This sign can mark phenomena, like the Fox sisters type of thing, like huge connection to the spirit world. This is where the deity that's often described as a form of Obatala or the younger Obatalas, or Shagiya, it finds this woman, this sign, the warrior, the retired warrior who knows the dangers of battle and now chooses not to engage, but can still chop off your head if he needs to, is there. And therefore his younger Rota Yaguna is there as well. But it's, there's a lot of interesting side of this. You find this cursed magnanimous figure is here in this sign. So the parts that come up that are fascinating, like a couple of things I'm just researching, because again, I'm going to go off of what's published so that I don't ever get in trouble. But there's obviously ties to the dead here, hugely. Obviously, it's a white sign. So the Obatala and the, and the, and the white deities are huge in this sign. But the notion, too, that I find fascinating is that in the, when specifically in Ifa, because we don't read the same way, Ifa does have its own witnesses that are der- derived, right? It has two witnesses and a judge figure. But they're not derived in the same way as Arabic or European geomancy. But the, the fact that they end up with this two figures and a, and, a, and a judge is fascinating. But in the diagnosis of a, of a problem, when you bring someone into the cult, if Ofu is Ofu Meji, so 10, you know, doubled itself, is followed by the sign, by your sign or by, your, by the other person's sign, something's off and like you got to like you might have to like get that person out of your house in your life real quick like this is where the replacement comes in and i can't speak to the accuracy of that because i'm not a babala but the fact that it's in many literatures is fascinating to me about like yeah. this idea of when this sign is followed by either your because when you initiate you receive a sign that is yours so you are an old dude incarnate walking through these things and that's important but you know Voice is strong here. The Obonis, the secret societies are strong here. Greed in this sign, death is your godmother. Not in, in Ejiok or it, um, like to pray. Populous, she's your wife, but in here at Ofun, she's your, she's your godmother, which also means that you cannot call upon her too much to stave her off. So you cannot work miracles to, you can work miracles in this sign, but you cannot 
prevent her from doing her job too much in the sign because she is your godmother. So she'll come for you. You prevent her from taking life too often. So this also shows that the sacredness of the intercessory job of you, you cannot help everyone. You cannot. And this sign speaks to that very heavily. No one will ever exist in a world where everyone is rich. And right. health itself is a form of wealth here. So this idea that like you will not be able to stop all deaths. If you try and create a world of constant abundance, which you brought in through your quote of Nick Civitello in that in your article, right? So the Jupiterian thing of like accumulation, at a certain point, we're going to run out of resources. But there's also the side of it like, where does it all go? Like this is, it has to stop this. Then there has to be enjoyment of the accumulation, which is the Venusian side, the mullet. And Laetitia, yeah. Yeah, so like we need that, like the benefics work together. It's strongly in that way. And then the malefics make us appreciate those eternal summer days of our youth. Uh, this is very, this is very Thomist's passion theory, right? The, the, the concupiscible passions and the irascible passions, right? The desiring things, things that we want or the things that we want to not have, which is still a kind of desire. And uh, the irascibles, that which we just, dis- that which destroys to get at a, a, the state of, that, that we want or the not state that we don't want. The importance of elders, both as forces of, of assistance and tradition as as a firm foundation and also as a bunch of pressure from on high or from below, right? In the case of, of the dead themselves. And yeah, this sense of like, where is the where is the growth going? Is it feeding things back in a sustainable way or is it the, the ideology of the cancer cell, the, the growth for growth's sake? Yeah, that's the that's our, our astrologer friend. Our friend, the astrologer, Nick Sivitello, uh, spoke, was, was speaking in, in, in correspondence with him about Jupiter and its relation to other planets. And it's this concept of like some of the worst qualities of, of Aquistio when it is, is influenced by less less useful uh, or helpful influences. But this possibility of bolstering this nothing but growth nature that seems to degrade the actual quality of life offered by such expansion. And, and Nick said that Jupiter being the only contributing factor to wealth is how you get ugly wealth. Brutalist structures and soulless quote finery. Worse yet, sports stadiums named after cell phone providers rather yeah. than great people. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a few sayings tied to Ofu. Mm-hmm. Um, death does not make friends with anyone. When death comes, the truth will not accept offerings. Mm-hmm. Death cannot be bribed. Death is never far or tired. Where the curse was born, which I talked, no one can catch the son of mystery in front of his parents. The rivers run dry, the sea never. Yams die, the thorn of Christ never dies. He who steals a small cat is chased by larger cats. The wind said, I cannot kill the king, but I can blow his hat off. Which is conversely there, referring to the crown. Take care of your position so that you're not a rebel or a renegade. But it's just, it's a, wisdom is the most refined beauty of a person. Treat all women as if they're your mother, comes up. Because you're obviously, most people are, from the male perspective here, but death never vomits the bodies it eats, but it cannot digest the soul. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, a little hope. I mean, it's right, you know, uh, to come up against the strictures and the dogmas of, of, a, of, of an oppressive tradition or tyrant is, is obviously where we may need to be rebels, but this is not a, this is not a sign that helps do, doing that. It helps build something that can potentially shelter others. That's, yeah, that's interesting. It's a builder and a rule follower. And sometimes that's very useful for someone that knows the rules backwards and forwards. I think there's a, so, there's a huge amount of wisdom associated in this side. I, I tend to make a lot out of the stick figures that you can make out of the figures, right? So <laughs> yes, this is 10, which is as its own thing, because if you're throwing calories, it's very different than drawing the figure. But the <laughs> figure itself, I, I don't know. I just, uh, the, diff- the relationship between Amicio and Ofu and Acquisitio is so strong there we talked about before how Amisio is the ability for, or excuse me, O'Shea is the harmony you're referring to both, right? But O'Shea is our ability to be heard by the gods. This is our salvation. This is like mm-hmm. sure that life continues. And Ofun is like the gods answering back in many ways, but it's spirits answering back in the everyday. And so it's like those things that rain down upon us, literally, that we might not even necessarily know are there because we're used to this way of life. But the fact that it looks like an averse person always makes me think of the connections between Acquisitio and the hangman or the tower, something, somebody falling where the people Mm. are are falling up out of something. And the notion of building wealth too high and the tower of Babel and like being so like God that you are, who's like God, let me cast you out. Like this, the the Michael thing of the lore that the name of Michael is the question that, 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 that God asks when Lucifer gets too haughty and therefore 
the angel that slays him or that can get rid of him is the one that's taking that name on as a moniker of like, no one is like God. Not that Michael is God-like, but yeah. that the answer is that like, no, he's the one that will remind you, you are not God. Uh, Whose house? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Michael's house. <laughs> so, yeah. I, that, that gravity element is, I, I, I like as well, the sense of like, what's the greatest force and what's the force that's pulling down in, in, in reading figures, like the pointy end down or the pointy end towards you being a stabilizing figure, being a figure that wants to be more present. Again, it, it's, a, it's a builder. The fact that it is two chevrons pointing down, it is double, double stable as yep. opposed to double pointing away, exiting. I also really love Sam Block's uh, take on the form of it, which is as a side view of coins falling into a bowl so that the bottom one, so, so it's two one, two one. So that the, the first two lines, the two and the one are these falling coins and the bottom two and one are the, are the, the side view, the, the, the cross section view of a like triangular bowl. And I, I like this idea of the attractant gravity of games captivation, right? It's kind of rendering, right? A, a gatherer above the massa, but like also that which if you drop it, it falls. And certainly in like ritual gesture of working with the Christio and its spirits and virtues, stacking bowls and also dropping things into things is, is I've found very, very, very effective for stirring those uh, and deploying those virtues. It's hard not to put all the like the gasps figures with Ophun onto like, like we don't even say the name at night. Like we change it to Mewa, which means 10 because it brings phenomena. It brings those things that like cause havoc it brings the evil eye of people looking at your wealth and saying it should be theirs. So it's, it, it, there's it, definitely a more money, more problems thing going on. Right? Yes, absolutely. And that's there in Acquisitio, but like, I, I don't know this. It's almost like the thing of like the difference between Fortuna major and Fortuna minor. Like sometimes I'll take a day full of Fortuna minor as opposed to like three days of Fortuna major. Cause then you're like, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. <laughs> something's going to happen. Like this is yes. why, okay. Like you can't what I've rolled the giant golden tank out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it. Mm, mm, mm. So this, like Amicio, like, I don't know. There's almost this like the Franciscan take you can take on Amicio. Like, no, I'm purging. I'm making way for what's to come so that it will be okay. And then, of course, we want to look to the opposite sign sometimes as a clue of like, what is that one making way for? Well, gain. But like, gain yeah. of what? Like yeah, less is less is not more. Gain is not yeah. loss. It's not about letting go. Not about losing. Not about putting down. Not about reducing. Not about being at a loss. Uh, and yeah, and also this the sign in both cases doesn't necessarily mean like like we could be like oh Amicio does have the sense of loss and emotion that goes with it, and that could be remedied by other things like Letizia or little things that come in. But Acquisitio to me does heavily stream the material. It's the material gain. It's the material or the quantity of friends you now are going to, you're going to see a lot of people and like, we can bring in the populist side. It can bring in the other sides of like, and now it's overwhelming. Like it just piles up. And the problem with like, if you have your gold, how do you then protect it with Carker? Like, how do you figure out how to store it? Cause it doesn't say you're going to keep it. Like that's, that's the, the beauty of the dynamics of all the signs is that like you can hoard it, but someone can still steal it from you. You can lock it up properly and forget that it's there. And not, you know, live in, in fear that if you spend it, you're not going to have it on a rainy day and the rainy day you never spend it on like, but like this, there's a beauty to the signs never being financially the, the, the herms as we once called them. So I don't know, this is, it's, that part is hard when this sign falls, it, it otherwise, like we definitely like, okay, is it going to be a good orientation or a bad? And like, I think it's worth pointing out again that my favorite interpretation of whether it's Ide or EB or Ide or Sogbo is less about good bl- or blessing and like something like bad, but more, is there an easy integration of the lesson or a difficult integration of the, of the things associated with this sign? And gonna, that is the easy way or the hard way. Yeah, like you're going to say like, oh, if someone's getting money, you can still get money, whether it's in Ire or a song world, because the sign brings money. But you could get money from someone passing that you cared about. You could get money because you now have a huge promotion but you now have more responsibility that you know how to handle and it's going to cause damage in your family and personal life. Um, it's absolutely a sign of stress, a sign of like a sign of encumbrance and over encumbrance. It's a monkey paw. This one, I, 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 one of the other signs is a little bit like don't. It's not that you can't trust it. You have to trust what's given to you. 
because you're going to have to use it as one of the resources to combat what comes with it. Right. So like, it's that thing of like, if you're royalty, like you're going to defend your royalty. Like that's like, it's very rare for monarchs to walk away from being royalty. And it, especially when they don't know what this, what it is to lose it. But that side of it of like, you're going to need everything you have to defend being royalty. And in the same way, this side makes you a king. It's like, oh, look, this is what it's like to have a little more. And you thought if you keep the mentality of what it was like when you were in an Amicio state, you will watch all of this go still Amicio. Bye bye real quick. Like, as we know, they're like, if you think as what is it? 90% of whatever the, the statistic is, I'll have to look it up. But the, like supposedly 90% of lottery winners are bankrupt within 10 years. And it, it's like, because you're not, you don't know what it's like to say the, the rich to maintain wealth is different than to achieve wealth. You need a car to be able to learn to drive a car. And if you are just given a car and gone like, all right, I'll no, 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 away I, you, go. you could, you could mercury it up and steal a car. Right. Right. Oh, well, yeah. But you have to like, okay, you don't have to buy it, but you have to have one. Right? Well, have to be, you can say buy. Yeah. But you have to have one. No, I understand. But we can be inventive in the ways that we, we secure said car. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we still have to work out how to actually draw. We can do the, the theory and the, the thing that... You can, you can make a real... I'm not advocating this. It's a hypothetical. You can make a really good counterfeit $100 bill, go spend it, and you'll have made money. <laughs> right. But you've also accrued... Yes, this is the, the danger of looking at a Quistio anywhere and being like, oh, it means I'm going to get money. It's also an increase of stress, right? Yeah. What else are you increasing? What else are, are you being more, are, are more eyes on you about now? Yeah. Now you're on camera. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other side that goes with, with this Ogu is the stricture of once it falls, you have to eliminate a lot of things from your life that are except excess in order to walk the tight and narrow because something is going to ask. People are watching you. People are trying to like whether or not if you have the side, it doesn't mean everybody's going to try to replace you, but you do have people that are going to try to replace you. They're going to want what you have, and they're going to think that if they take what you have, that will make them like you. Whether it's knowledge, whether it's money, whether it's lover, whether it's where you live, whether it's just things that weren't theirs to begin with. So this sign can signal a lot. In the same way, I think it's interesting because the birth of uh, the herbalist is born in one of these signs, like the thought that you could then go take the knowledge of the green world and right. apply it to people, but you can't do like, how do you get through this? Like you can't cure everyone. It won't work. Death will still find a way. We usually say life will out, but in this side, death will out as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that side of it of like not getting too spicy, like the idea, like this is the sign that when it falls in people's life readings under certain circumstances, like paint your house walls in white, you will only wear white for the rest of your life. You will eat non-spicy foods. You will eat things that are bland. And it's like, oh man, like, but that person has to be strict because the battles and the things that are in store for them in their life, they have to be ready for. So like eliminating a favorite food isn't about taking something away so much as that you'll recognize when someone has altered your food in front of you. Oh, that idea of I don't eat spicy foods, not because of the spice, but because someone could poison me. Not this isn't me, but I'm like hypothetical. I eat spicy food. But just that idea that you need to be able to tell when you're being poisoned. And if you are in a place where you're eating, where you're drinking all the time, because alcohol is often taken away in this sign. If you're drinking all the time, you will recognize spirit contact necessarily is genuine because you won't be able to tell if you were drunk or if it was a spirit. And often the people in this sign that have this sign prominent have very good spirit contact. And so like you get away from the things that would could be making you yourself be dismissed as not being genuine, as well as being disciplined enough to develop the things that make you genuine. So both it's not indulging for the, not for the sake of taking things away to punish you but to develop the train you for the things that will reward you. Getting behind the car the thing rather than being hit by the car is the thing. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I don't know why I, when we pick things, sometimes like I picked Valifor probably because of the association with thieves and business, but I don't remember why I picked turquoise. And then it was just like, I was probably reading about something of turquoise at the time. And then it's like, oh, there's something interesting to this here. And Pimpernel was because it's worth to talk about grimoire recipes every so often and be, where does this come in? And I don't know why I picked this. Usually probably because we had talked about it so long, it's worth revisiting. But it's interesting to think about the phenomena of natural nature of this and acquisitio, but with the Fox sisters of the founding of a, of a tradition, that's the wrappings and the phenomena that goes with that. It brought them wealth, it brought them faith, and it brought a world of trouble for them. The, the <laughs> Dismas gains eternal life at the cost of his life. 
through tremendous suffering and pain. And interestingly, his arms are displayed in the upper cup of Aquisitio, right? So his arms are played, displayed behind his head and um, that cup form. Like he's, there's something interesting about that. Oh, and sometimes his feet are bound as well. So he's, yeah, at point at the bottom. Yeah. So then justice, there we have that whole side of justice and this sign, this Odu brings divine justice. It brings mm-hmm. not like swift, like lightning strikes to kill your opponent, but like order will be reestablished through the birth of this sign. Like we will figure things out. Mm-hmm. It is difficult for the individual, but better for the community sometimes. Yeah, it's so weird. It's so weird. Like sometimes it can be accused of like clipping a person's wings so that they don't fly too big in this sign. And like you have to be careful. Of, like, I don't know. That's a very difficult position. I don't like that interpretation of it. But also, what do you do when you see like what as a diviner, if you see that someone has the potential to do horrible things and is 90 percent the signs in front of you say 90 percent, this person is going to kill someone in the next year or that they are going to hurt people or cause a big accident or do things like this. What do you do? Like, you, you like, you say, thank you very much. And thank you for, and, oh, no, I, you don't read for them anymore. And you like light a candle or whatever saint you work with. you like, please let that person just have a normal life. Please let me be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> please. I hope this is a good thing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And when is the chart for for the diviner? And when is the chart for the client? Or when does it not matter? Like Rubius of like, this just doesn't work out today. What's the eight ball say? Not now. Tra- answer and clear try again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's real loud mix of that. curious if there's some way to use the Pimpernel to that extent of can you use it to prepare to erase the bad like can it be a Vajrasattva mantra, mantra in plant form so like the Vajrasattva mantra is used the hundred syllable mantra is used to like clear off negative karma but also to erase the mis- if you say it three times as part of a larger working to erase any mispronunciations or errors you made during the work so yeah. 80s will still receive it as perfect so it's like, here's my intent, but you got to like focus when you're doing it. So it's, so it's like running a spell checker. Yeah, it is. Or a karma checker. And so like, I wonder like, okay, Pimpernel, if it predicts like when we talk about like bad weather and that's a sign when you wouldn't do geomancy, right? So when there's a storm. Yeah. So like with the Pimpernel, can you be like, I invoke the Pimpernel, like put Pimpernel juice all over everything and be like, the weather is good for this reading. <laughs> like this house has been cleared. Like, is there a way to use that to preempt them? Because it is a cleansing herb. But can we be like, okay, I'm harnessing good potential here. Is it, am I just being too new agey with it? And be like, no, 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 let this thing live. Associations be favorable in this working I'm about to do. Because when I first saw that in print, I was like, I didn't, <laughs> but it's also terrible. And like, I, it was like, I had the whole debate of like, I mean, is it any different than me pulling out the felt tip, my teacher pulling out her red felt tip pen and me like, and I need the dragon's blood. Like, okay, that's inventive. <laughs> I'm not using an apple. I'm using a drawing of an apple. But like, mm-hmm. what's different when we're like, may all the astrological implications of this moment be working towards my favor of like, I don't think the planet's just moved for you. There's plenty of like reversing the reverse engineering a thing to get what it does when it does that. Like if you could physically close the poor man's weather glass opening to suggest there's rain, like is that linked then? Does that then become a way of like staving off rain? Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. And then you have <laughs> the, the, the notions in of like, if you need a black cat, Sometimes you can cover a cat in boot polish and that counts. Yeah, that, that counts. Fulfills, but naming a white cat blackie does mm-hmm. not. Like, unless it belongs to a family called the Blacks, in which case I would say that's a black cat. But like, <laughs> it's funny, it's like the that order that has to exist in English of like all the parts of speech or it sounds funky. Yeah. It's yeah. like you learn it through years. It's the same thing. You're like, yeah, that's a black cat. Nope, that's not. Like, you're like, where's the judge of me that says, yeah okay (laughs) yes this is on the or i just saw it was in a private group so i won't reference the content too much but it was uh jason miller one of his groups was talking about holy water but gradations of holy water for an experiment and it's really helpful to see that type of thing of like if you can't get number one or two yes seven will work and that's what you have at the time but it is better the higher up in this list you can go this is the it's not that one's pure, it has more of what you're looking for. So it's, it's, if you don't have all seasonings, you know, a dash of salt will work. But if you have other seasonings, it's going to change the flavor. It's going to be more full. And so I just, I applaud that type of like, not a hierarchy of like best, but best practices, best possibilities, all things being equal. Here is the hierarchy of holy waters. 
all things being equal, here is the hierarchy of anything. And I, I think I saw this too in when you when you see it in Hoodoo, when it goes from personal effect to like clothing in the sexual fluid of somebody is more powerful than clothing just with the sweat, uh, right. which is more powerful than just the clothing. Then going down to like just a name. Yeah. But if you don't have the name, then you, you, you know, you go from there. But like yeah. contagion spreads, but it like can also, there's also a sense that like it, the further it's influence, the further the throw, the, the less severe it might be. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah. And then you've got contextual, like if you are trying to do this thing, then this is the best one to use because, right. And then we start to understand the context of things. And also that makes me think of uh, a thing that, you know, I'm very grateful that you often emphasize, which is that just dumping 10 money gathering herbs is not necessarily better than using two because how do they react to each other in the same way of like, sure, using five spices is going to make a dish more complicated than just using one, but are they going to, is it going to be a good meal? Or have you just like, have you just made ketchup ice cream? That, that more is not necessarily right. better, right? <laughs> well, and, it's like, and like a party. Like I think that that metaphor of costing like a party of like, sometimes I want to hang out with you by yourself. Sometimes it's fine if we have like three or four other people there. Sometimes it's okay if there's 20, but like I'm not going to have the same quality time with you unless we're really rude to everyone else that's in there. <laughs> so like, what are the proportions of those herbs that are in there and why like it's not just, not even just more is better, but also understanding the, the minutia, which is exactly what we're talking about, like in the diviner's chart of like, if we're going to look at classical stuff, just knowing if what you're going off is the witnesses and the judge, that's the start of a shield reading. But if you look back and you can do via punti or you can do the fact that via is in like 10 of these slots, something it, like we need to figure out what this is via in 10 slots, I don't think is mathematically possible, but because they've got to add up at some point. But let's say something was my, but anyway, the, the, the notion <laughs> there, right. like, I, and we even talked about this of, I think it's just because I listened to the, it's something I told myself that when we would do a figure, that I would go back and listen to the episode where we last talked about the figure. And I think we were, I was talking there about using like Lenormand house based systems for tarot cards, which is like, yes, of like, you can have the three of cups in the house of justice. So you could, you could have a 21 card spread that, that each one of those is each of the major arcana. And then you deal the deck into that and you'd be like, the moon is in the house of the moon. We are doubly moon right now. Like uh -huh. this is how you do a grand tableau in, in Lenormand, right? So like you, you could have the writer might show up in the house of the writer, but it is significant when you're like, okay, I want to look not only from the, the, the topography of something, but the subterranean geography of like, what's the foundation of things too, so that you can look at that. And I think that type of subtlety and divination, it, that cannot come right away. That's one of those, it's you and I have both talked about this in regards to teaching divination. It's really fun to teach the initial ascriptions of things. Because everybody's like, now I have the info and now you got to study it so that we can do the next part where you actually start doing readings. Because until that point, there, there's a, just a certain point where it's like, so we can see that. I don't know what those connections are. Did you memorize that? I, I don't know. Like, it's really hard when you want to be like, no, I want to do advanced things, but we can't do advanced things until we're all on the same level with knowing what these things mean. You can't read until at least the basic phonetics of what the alphabet is. Yeah, yeah. You don't even need and to you know the order. But you yeah. do no, no, no. K is a cuss sound. Right, right. You can make some amazing experimental poetry in languages you can't speak, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to, I don't know, to extend this metaphor, book gigs to be able to speak that poetry to anyone. Absolutely. That's it's actually a really great metaphor. And we know that when you try and speak any language, you're amazingly poetic at first. Because like, you have to, you really have to think about like, I don't know a of the words I want to use. So you end up saying weird things, which is also really forgiving. I think that's the value, honestly, of learning foreign language or being forced to learn foreign language is then you're also more forgiving of people that speak more languages because the American I default towards foreign languages, like you're an idiot. And you're like, or the person speaks eight languages and they just don't speak ours. Like, <laughs> right. And again, that thing about like children of bilingual households confused, which was one view for a while. Yes. Uh, and the emphasis was like, you should all speak the same language. Or are they not confused at all and are just more articulate than the teachers who are monolingual and have picked the best word for the thing and that will back and forth between those two or multiple languages because that's the most, that's a more efficient and or uh, expressive or beautiful way of communicating. Like turquoise, the bilingual stone of fire and water. Right, right. Like like the good acquisitio that combined, that, that there is a gain of complexity and nuance in the combination of things, not just piling more things on top. The, the, the good thief, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're going off of the older Testament of like 
thieves should have their hands cut off type of mentality. And like here, his hands are tied in tribute to that in some way. I'm just realizing, right? Like that's fascinating. And okay. Penitent goes into it. This annoys no sense. Recanting and not recanting for appearance versus uh, for profit versus for for removal of pressure. Mm. For profit, P R O F I T, or for profit. <laughs> Sometimes for profit cult. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Dear listeners, thank you so much for, for joining us on this, this latest episode. It's been fun for me, at least. I hope for you too, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, it's just been fun. Yeah. Good thieves, demon thieves, thieves of time and weather, thieves of conception, thieves of authority, thieves of dualism. I want to say thieves of anxiety, but only because there's that one of my favorite lines in the masses, deliver us all from, or deliver us from anxiety or all anxiety. And I think of the armor Christie as a weapon against that you know, the mortality threat. Yeah, heck yeah, yeah, yeah. What what how do we circle in a sanguine manner? How do we circulate in a in a uh, full blooded manner? How do we uh, yeah, how do we weave the space with others uh, as well? How do we uh, seek to replace that which needs to be replaced and and bolster that which doesn't? Yeah. When do we not need to to reinvent the wheel? Uh, and when can we work our resources and our endeavors to move on? When does the teacher like a good teacher is hopefully paving the way, cutting the steps up the mountain for the students to surpass them. There's something about the, the nature of Mercury and this the notion of thievery and wittiness, the kind of laziness or the equation of joy with laziness as opposed to like, it's necessary to keep moving. You, you yeah. need to have joy in the momentum or if you can't and you need to keep the momentum up, then you need to find ways to stop for joy, to build your bank back up, to build your cash back up. But ultimately, the thing with as God of Travelers, Mercury still gets somewhere. I think that's the, there's something in that with all of the things even talking today. The thief is ultimately rewarded, is getting somewhere, literally in paradise. But the, one, there's, it's never too late in the case of St. Dismas. With Valifar, even the, the getting somewhere, like that idea of he's good until he betrays you. Um, mm -hmm. friends are good until they betray you and he can play on that side of it of like there is no lack of consequence in the Valifar lens like right. keep on or well, you'll be good with him I was saying enough rope to hang yourself yeah yeah exactly and the, the Pimpernel too like it, it gets you somewhere like the patience to watch it open or like just watching it itself to see when it closes and then Turquoise is getting so this is the fire that pr brings order and preciousness, Arma Christi, or obviously it's a means to eternal life. The combating of the devil through the torture of Jesus, the scapegoating of Jesus. And then with Ophun and Aquisitio, there's a movement there for sure. Many, many movements, both movement hierarchically down, but the gain is a movement itself. Justice is the movement of the scales. Um, right. The weight of things. Yeah. And the Fox sisters have their own movements there literally starting a movement um, mm -hmm. but also just the movement of spirits into incorporation and the movement of the context by which you are allowed to articulate these things by, by, by the means by which we are telling truths now yeah the judas kiss or the spitting crowd that's a good set of uh good set of sesame street topics it's the sesame treaty <laughs> the sesame treaty uh, the sesame tree the sesame tree oh <laughs> the, the loudest whispers in the deep t in the in the east west west midlands there is the small town of sesamus <laughs> but no thank you so much for indulging i hope you're it has been an acquisitional time as opposed to a time of loss and we are going to keep cranking one out a month just that's our goal this year to see what happens with one a month and uh, we miss january so we might have to two at some point but hey for the rest of the year. Stable, <laughs> outflowing game, right? <laughs> yes. Like the waters from Chalchutniquist's skirt or the blood from Jesus' hands, which made every flower in the world that is red. And garlic. Give it a little spice. Waker must awaken. Yeah. May all your hills be gold with uh, and covered in turquoise. All right, Al. It's a bit of pleasure. It's always nice seeing you. And uh, hopefully we recorded. 